Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Sunday show here on the line. Uh, I, I'm here today. I'm Matt. Joining me, Paul G. How are you, sir? I am doing well. Thank you so much. You you look well. You look like you're eager to, you know, dig into some real Sunday stuff. I want some calls. Absolutely. Well, we have, we have already got calls. By the way, uh, this is the Sunday show on the line. It's uh, one of many sh- call-in shows that are right here on the line. You can call 720-619-2288 or down below the um, in the description, there will be a link to how you can call in on your computer. Uh, right, yep, down below there. I am wearing the Unafraid to Disappoint Daddy uh, <coughs> Magical or Otherwise shirt that is the... Uh, Jimmy Snow. I'm pretty sure I won the birthday month competition, but it's okay because I I really like Jimmy's shirt, so I just decided to to put it on and wear it today. How, and, how uh, magnanimous, ma- magnanimous of you, I guess that's the word. Yeah, I can be the bigger person and not just oh, because great. I got a double XL shirt. <laughs> but uh, so it's a wild week. This was originally the weekend that we were going to do Lion Con, and it's because there's a total solar eclipse and totality passes very near Austin. Originally, we were going to do line con this weekend and make a big deal out of it. Uh, but the scheduling stuff, thankfully, uh, got moved. We're going to do line con another time, but that didn't stop people from heading down here. Uh, and neither did the bad weather report. There's a chance that uh, like, literally, if you look at the totality map, um, my backyard is not in totality, but if you walk past my backyard across a parking lot, that's maybe 150 yards or so, you'll be in totality. That's where the, the map of totality, uh, shows, but also it looks like it's going to be cloudy. And mm-hmm. so who knows what we're going to get to see, but we have, uh, friends and guests, uh, coming down. Some of the, uh, some of the other line hosts are here. And uh, yeah, and by the way, Jimmy is unwell. And, and I don't just mean like that dude's got something wrong with him. I mean, Jimmy's ill, but he posted a message with a picture of, of him and his dog and basically said, hey, you're not probably not going to see me much for the month of April, but, you know, don't worry. Um, he's getting treatment and we're optimistic and looking forward. But huge thank you to Paul for agreeing to come on and, and host with me today. We have My these pleasure. callers. We have atheist callers. We have just everything. So here's the question for today. There are theists who have been saying some things that I find incredibly ridiculous. One of my favorites uh, that I called out is they showed a picture of the Statue of Liberty getting struck by lightning, um, which shouldn't be a surprise to anybody since we literally put lightning rods on the Statue of Liberty to make that happen. And then there was an earthquake in New York, which was evidently having an earthquake somewhere in within a few days of a potential eclipse is enough for them to get up in arms. No, it doesn't matter how many, you know, earthquakes are happening all over the place every day. But now, uh, Someone named Sarah said, uh, between this and the earthquakes the U.S. has recently experienced, do we really need an eclipse to tell us God is not happy with us as a nation? Well, I have really bad news for Sarah. She should go learn some science because this earthquake, or sorry, this eclipse that's happening tomorrow um, was predicted um, not only long before the modern Republican Party um, tried to destroy the world with Donald Trump, but before the United States even existed. So if it's it's really weird that God has a message about how unhappy he is, and he planned this so far in advance that this could have been predicted and, you know, down to like minutes and what the path was going to be and where you could go for total coverage um, back before the, the United States even existed. And it could have been predicted even earlier than then if we'd have had a good understanding of the math. But, you know, back in the 18th century, William Halley was making predictions about uh, eclipses in, in the London area and others. And, and even in the BCE period, there was a way to try to calculate eclipses that was surprisingly accurate um, in certain areas at certain times. But that's okay. 
you don't have to understand it. And if you believe that God is a, is a powerful being, then of course God could have planned this eclipse from the instant he created the universe and everything. He knew everything was going to happen, including you know that the United States was just going to be awful at some point and really wanted to make a clear message for everybody. So before the dawn of time, God planned out this eclipse, the lightning strike on the Statue of Liberty, and the earthquake that, that happened out of New York. And I have bad news for God. A lot of people are interpreting all this as marketing for the new Ghostbusters film. So your message didn't come out as clearly as you wished. Sorry, God. Yeah. If you could show up, like, I mean, I get it. You may not have a phone um, to call into our call-in show, but if you could send your representatives here to explain this, explain how um, tomorrow's eclipse is a sign from God and how we should interpret that sign, how we know it's a sign, um, that'd be really helpful. It'd be really nice, though, if you'd make them agree and be very clear. But theists, if you're out there and you think that uh, all of this is a sign from God, maybe it's maybe it's the end time stuff. After all, it's happening when there's there's war in Israel. Um, you know, you, you could piece don't, all these. Don't forget together. rumors. I've heard rumors of wars, Matt. You heard? Oh my gosh! Because I just knew about the wars. If there's also rumors of wars, mm -hmm. maybe they got a point. No. Yeah. Anyway, we are excited to hear. Um, what all these messages from God mean, but we're going to start off the show with Dylan, uh, somewhere in the United States, pronouns are he, him, who wants to explain why faith is rational. Hi, hey, Dylan, how are you defining faith? Hey, uh, hey, Matt. Hey, Paul. Um, thanks for uh, taking some time to, to chat with me. Um, I would kind of, as far as faith goes, a uh, belief or trust in, in this context, I guess, specifically in a God or gods of, uh, of some kind would be my definition for, for faith. And so I believe that that is a rational position to hold. So would you like me to kind of go into that? Or? Well, well, I have questions because you just defined faith as a belief, but it, in my understanding of faith is that it's not the belief faith is the justification for the belief. Okay. Um, can you maybe uh, flesh that out a little bit uh, more, more fully, I guess? Sure. Or what's somebody the believes the that distinction a, there? Sure. Somebody believes that a God exists. They could believe that thing for a number of different reasons. They could have evidence for it, um, or they could accept this based on faith. Faith is the excuse people give for believing things when they don't have a good reason. Because if you believe something and you have a good reason, you just give the reason. Like when somebody says, hey, how do you know we share uh, common ancestry with other primates? No scientist ever says, oh, we take it on faith or it's justified by faith. Instead, they point to the good reasons, the evidence. Okay, well, so I, I guess where I would go, like if, if I were to play LeBron James one-on-one -on -one in basketball, um, I, I have faith that I would lose very badly. Um, but well, I don't, I don't have sure. any, LeBron... I don't have faith though, Dylan. I, I don't need any faith that you would lose badly. I have a reasonable expectation <laughs> based on evidence comparing LeBron's physical act, activity, activity accomplishments and record to yours. Right. We can calculate this and we can actually we could we could reasonably put some odds in on just how badly he's going to beat you. <laughs> well, and I am a Lakers fan, so so I I would hope LeBron would do well. But um, but as far as um, from a theistic perspective, um, I would say that what you're describing sounds to me more like a blind faith rather than bridging the gap from evidence to a conclusion would be uh, kind of the distinction that I would um, approach that with. <laughs> So if we're bridging the gap from evidence to a conclusion, isn't that what we right. do all the time in science where we're making, we're taking evidence and we're building a case and we're making an inference and yet we don't tend to call that faith? Um, I mean, I, I guess when you have the hypothesis before the experiment is done, there would be a sense in which your hypothesis is 
I mean, yeah, the word faith isn't necessarily used, but I think you have kind of a prob- probable, if I could say the word probabilistic um, sort of approach to it. And then in science, you're usually mes- mer- uh, mer- messaging something or measuring something that is empirical. So you would have a result after it's done. It, isn't it, with isn't theism, it a it's fact? If a God exists, an actual yeah. agent being exists, isn't that a fact yep. that is empirical? Um, I would say if the God was material, um, existing within space-time, then in, in theory, yes. Well, not in theory, I guess if it, that was true, that would be the case. But if you were talking about sort of the faceless, timeless, immaterial uh, sort of being, I think that you, would, you wouldn't be able to measure it because it would go beyond the realm of our material existence. But so if the God, well, this, is, this is not about the ontology of what a God is. If a God interacts right. with reality in a detectable way, then that would produce correct. empirical evidence for that God, correct? Absolutely, yes. D- does the God that you're advocating interact with reality in a, de- in a detectable way? Yes. That, cool. That, so that give us the empir- yeah. give give us the empirical evidence that God is interacting with reality in a way that you've detected. Well, where I would start with that is the most clear uh, evidence of it would be in the person of Jesus Christ. Of course, that's not in today's world, and you're talking about the sort of archaeology, you know, medical. And of course, he we got the hefty problem of him taking his body with him um, after he resurrected, but... Um, but in you, have, you, have a peskier, here, right? you have a peskier problem, Dylan, which is um, <laughs> you have no way to demonstrate that he actually existed at all, but even if he did, um, as you're pointing out, if he left and took his body with him, I, I was asking for empirical evidence. Now, is it possible that there was someone that we identify as Jesus and that he was not, in mm-hmm. fact, divine. Sure. Cool. So if that's possible, you just said the clearest empirical evidence for God is in the person of Jesus Christ, and yet you just also acknowledge that it's possible that Jesus wasn't divine. So what's the empirical evidence from Jesus that confirms God? Yeah, well, I would actually, and and this would be a concession I I would willingly make, is I would try to move from empirical data into uh, the historical evidence, the reliability of the Gospels, and and those sorts of things. I I don't think there's a science that you already agreed. Except that you already agreed that the God you're advocating has given us empirical evidence. And why wouldn't you present empirical evidence? Isn't empirical evidence just de facto better than appealing to historical records yeah i mean i think i think any cool so and, why, and course, why wouldn't we go yeah. with the best available evidence so where's the empirical evidence yeah and if the best available evidence was and again it, the claims of this would be where we'd have to go into things like um the data between, I'm sure you have plenty of statistics as far as uh, things like answered prayer and, and claims to miracles and all this other sort of stuff. Um, but that's not really where I would kind of want to uh, stake my my claim in terms of the, the modern claims. I, I would really, uh, although I think you could make a case for those, but um, I'd be more interested in, in really focusing on, on who Jesus is in that context. Uh, but um, I, I bet you would, and, and but that, since you've already agreed that empirical evidence exists and it's better, why won't you present the empirical evidence? Why would we? Why would we want to have a discussion based on weaker evidence and stories about some person's possible character instead of the empirical evidence for God? Yeah, if I was in a in a position to uh, lay out. A variety of peer-reviewed journals on uh, these uh, multiple these claims of uh, miracles and God's interaction in in our modern day, um, like a like a Caleb Jackson or or, or somebody like that. But uh, that's not my particular area that I would be 
uh, able to speak to. And so rather than speak out of ignorance, I would rather um, that's just not a place that I'm going to be able to speak particularly strongly to. So what yeah, convinced you, sorry, what convinced you no, no. was uh, stories in a book? Is that essentially like you're saying all oh, these modern miracles, they don't, I don't put much weight on those and I don't put much weight on other physical evidence. What, what convinced you Dylan was stories in a book? Is that what we're, what, what we're saying? Um, <laughs> uh, well, I, I mean, I, I would, I would say this, that, um, I, I became a believer when I was 19. And so, um, and my knowledge of, uh, the Bible, the, uh, gospels, the, um, different epistles of the apostle Paul, um, the, all, all those other sorts of historical claims that, that came, came later. And I, and I would say that that's probably true for a lot of believers. Um, so, so, my so, belief, so then why uh, did you, why did you call into our show today and pitch uh -huh. that as the best reason for us to believe when that is not in fact, why you came to believe? Well, really my, my concern was more with the, the topic on the video of is faith rational. Um, and, and so I was more going to make a case for the rationality of faith, but it, it sounded like when, when. Matt and I were, were talking earlier that there was a, um, a bit of a difference in regards to uh, our sort of initial definitions, which, which of course, we can, we can have that. Um, but to me, when I think about rationality, it's something that comes based upon reason or logic. And I would argue that faith is rational, even if, and I'm not conceding this, I'm a, I'm a Christian, but even if I were to concede that there wasn't actually even a God or God, faith would still be rational because of the numerous benefits to a person's life in the sense of a sense of purpose or direction or joy or those kinds of things. And so faith would be rational on that basis. Okay, good. I just wanted to get the call back on track. So we'll hand it back to Matt because we were off on a weird Bible tangent. Is faith oh. rational, Matt? I I, it's it's, it's going to be difficult to say that faith is rational if we can't agree on a definition of faith. Dylan, you initially yeah, um, gave a definition of faith that was very synonymous with just intellectual assent. Like, if you are going to come sure, in here and say yeah. that faith is belief, Matt and I both acknowledge that intellectual assent is a rational conclusion at some point. So how would right. you... What's the difference between straight up intellectual assent and the faith that you want to say is rational? Yeah, I, I guess you would go beyond. It would be like saying, if you started with saying that I believe um, the, the intellectual assent, I believe Jesus was a person, um, and, and you could assent to the claim, I believe that Jesus was the Messiah, that he's, he's God incarnate. And, and you could even come to those conclusions and still on the basis of other factors say, but I, I refuse, I deny to put my, my trust or my belief or my submission to this being. And so I, I think the, the faith in a religious context, most people, uh, Muslims, Jews, Christians, etc., um, is when you move beyond a sort of intellectual assent to the reality and into a walking after a pursuing the things of this god or gods or um so, whatever holy book that that a group may ascribe to so let me let me see if i understand this you're saying that it doesn't matter whether or not there is a god what matters is putting your confidence in a character because of the potential possible possible positive benefits to your life and that this makes makes it rational to assent to the claim even if it's not true no i, I would i would say that it absolutely matters if there's a god um in in the sense of to a person you, you literally that, said you literally said you literally said faith is rational even if there's not a god right i believe that I believe that. Okay. But I also and, believe and so that why it is it why is it why is it why is it that when I ask you about that you go back to telling me that you believe there's God. If faith is rational whether or not there's a God. I I was mm -hmm. asking you about your reasons for saying that faith is rational and my understanding is you were saying it is rational 
because there are positive benefits to your life, irrespective of whether or not there is a God. Right. Yeah. I was simply defending the rationality of faith of any kind, not necessarily I'm just my asking you if that's correct. All, wow. All I was doing was asking you if that's a correct summation of what you said. Yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't, I think if just for defending the rationality, yes. Of, of a, I, of it's a so difficult faith. to get an answer that starts with, yeah, no. So <laughs> if your position is <laughs> I, that I faith is rational because there are positive benefits to it, whether it's true or not, is that correct? Yes. What are the positive benefits of belief that aren't available if in fact you disbelieve something that's not true so for like for example it whether there's a god or not you're saying it is rational to to believe although i think it seems you're arguing it's rational to act as if you believe because i can't believe something unless i'm convinced that it's true i can act as if i am convinced um but then i'm just engaged in deception so what's the positive benefit of believing in let's say christianity that still exists even if christianity is true or sorry even if christianity is not true okay so so just to clarify what what are the benefits of acting that way even if it's not true is that is that is that the question yes if christianity isn't true and you're claiming that acting as if it's true is still beneficial i want to know what those benefits are yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would point to the way that um, a lot of young people who maybe are, are struggling in a certain way join the military because they want a sense of structure, uh, perhaps, or um, that they maybe feel like... Dylan. Um, Dylan. You, yeah. I'm asking you what the benefits are to believing in Christianity if, in fact, Christianity is false. What does the military have right. to do with that? Well, it could be for somebody, and again, th th I'm speaking as somebody who believes that Christianity is true and that there's so many benefits beyond this. Jesus um, fucking my, my... Christ, why you got to make this so difficult? If Christianity is false, <laughs> what is the benefit to believing that you think makes it rational? Uh, structure, guidance, community, uh, love, is there is there is there, um, there is it's... there a way to have structure, guidance, and community without believing a lie? Yes. Then why would you advocate for believing something that's not true instead of something that is true that gives you structure? I'm not. I'm simply making you the case are. that it would be no, rational no, Dylan, either way. No, Dylan, you are. You said that it's rational even if it's not true. And I'm trying to expose that it's a mistake to say that it's rational even if it's not true, because the things that you're pointing to as benefits of the lie of Christianity can be achieved by other lies as well and by things that are true. So given the option to believe between a variety of lies that may provide a delusion-based benefit to a truth that might provide that benefit, why wouldn't we opt for the truth? You should. Cool demonstrate that it's true because i don't care if you think it's rational if it's untrue i only care about whether or not it's true okay um I, again it, with brevity um again and and i know like this is something paul could speak to i just look at the historical record, the reliability of the gospels the letters so on and so forth the the building of the church and the in the face of Roman persecution and opposition and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and yeah, I, I don't mean to, I don't want to hide this. Which, portion which of it. one My of those things, no. well. yeah. which one of those things, which one of those things that you just, just listed requires Christianity to be true. I wouldn't say required. I would simply say leads to I wouldn't either. Uh, rational. I think all of those, all of those things you listed can happen even if Christianity is not true, right? Sure, that's a possibility. So those things are not evidence that Christianity is true, right? 
No, I disagree. I don't think evidence has to be 100% conclusive. I didn't say anything about 100%. I said that all those things are possible, whether Christianity is true or not, which means those things are not sufficient to determine that Christianity is true. Not definitively, no. So what is? That's the thing we care about. See, you called in to talk about faith being rational, and then you argued that faith is rational even if it's not true. And personally, I don't give a fuck about whether somebody's opinion is that faith is rational if something's not true. I care about whether or not it's true. And so then we got to, how do you demonstrate that it's true? And you started by listing a bunch of things that cannot demonstrate that Christianity is true. They are insufficient to the task, right? Again, not 100% definitively, but I think it can lead you, know, you to that conclusion. Your, your, tap dance, your tap dance is really looking incredibly weak. Which of those things, either individually or combined with any of the other things you listed, com combine to make a sufficient case for Christianity? I would argue that the cumulative case, the collective of all of those different things, the again, the things I mentioned, uh, gospels, historical accounts, the building of the church, et cetera, et cetera, um, all of those things would, would work together to combine things that would, of course, take much longer to nuance and, and go through and, and things of that nature. And, I'm, and, and if well, you want to dive into any one of those in particular, we, we of course, uh, can dive into some of those things. But um, but, but none of those are what convinced you, that. right, Dylan? None of those things are what convinced you. Well, it would be more a convincing to stay in the belief, but but the initial belief was um, a, a was prior to me coming to knowledge of those things. Right, so those things, those things alone, and William Lane Craig would agree. There's lots. Of, I, I know virtually no apologist that would agree, and no historian that would agree that the histori histor historological things that you just listed there are sufficient to come mm -hmm. to faith. That the Holy Spirit absolutely needs to be a part of it, because we do not have any historians who are just pure historians who. Uh, list those things that you say as a reason why they came to faith we have we have a we have a former cop and we have a former reporter but that's about as close as we get so <laughs> uh, so i do, so why are you not saying that personal experience and the holy spirit are part of the ingredients for the cake that are needed to get there when that well, was true I, for I you you needed you needed the holy spirit to get there yeah, well, and, and that's obvious, that's a theological issue, of course. I, I and, and I recently have come to sort of a, a shift in my own soteriology as far as as far as that's concerned. But um, but I, I would argue that you know Romans chapter ten, faith comes from hearing, hearing of the word of God. And so in Romans one sixteen, the gospel is the power of God to those who believe, the Jew first and also the Gentile. So I think there's so a yeah, we we we're, it's not we're not a Bible verse show, so we'll just so you called in Dylan with two points. You yeah. wanted to say that it's rational for people to come to an intellectual assent of a proposition even when they're not 100% certain. That seems like part A. And part B was sure. you're fine with placebos uh, provided that they have a positive benefit. Those seem to be the two prongs of what you wanted to call in today. Is that correct? Definitely would affirm uh, point number one. And then, and then point two, I would just push back on the language that I'm personally okay. I would just simply say again, um, based on the definition of rational, I was simply asserting that a person could rationally, um, as Matt put it, act as though something was true, even if it wasn't, and still receive benefits like the ones I mentioned uh, previously. But of course, if I'm talking to somebody in an attempt to um, speak to them about the truth of Christianity. I'm not going to walk away from the conversation going, but hey, even if it's not true, um, you know, it might not be true. So I don't know. Um, I, I would obviously try to spend time with that person and, and work through the, the things I mentioned, the gospels, et cetera. So. So is it, was there a point in time where it was rational to believe that the sun orbited the earth? rational to believe um i guess if you didn't have evidence you could uh rationally think one way or the other uh, well, if you didn't know better once upon a time 
the available evidence led to a completely rational conclusion that the sun orbited the earth, that it went around the earth. Yes. I mean, at that time, you don't know what you don't know. So I guess it would be rational to, which which means that. that rational, rational is independent from whether or not the claim is true. Agreed. Yep. Cool. This is why I don't care if you think faith is rational or if you have a, an esoteric definition of faith, or you want to say faith is the intellectual assent of something in the absence of, of confirmation, or however you want to dance around it. The, the issue here is, is there a God? And you have, have acknowledged that you believe there is a God that can and does yeah. provide empirical evidence, but you don't want to present empirical evidence. You want to appeal to historical things which you acknowledge are insufficient to the task. And I'm wondering if I'm sitting here, you and I are uh, sitting at a bus stop and we've got an hour to kill. Mm -hmm. What is your case for why I should believe in a God? Uh, That's a, that's a great question. Um, I know I've done this for for 20 years. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, um, and, and I know you, you, you've spoken with some of the some of the leading names and, and, and that kind of thing. So, um, but uh, but yeah, I guess for me, I, I would start off with sort of a, a bare theism. You know, um, you know, nothing doesn't come out of nothing. You know, something doesn't come out of nothing. So, how do you uh, know what's eternal? Is it the universe itself? Um, well, I, I would I would argue that that there, there's no. I mean, nothing is. Well, it's it's nothing. So there would have to be. Um, at least does, within our does material science, world. Does science, does science in any way advocate for something coming from nothing? Not, not to my knowledge. No. So why on earth would that be a starting point? Why would you start by suggesting something that science doesn't say is wrong? Well, because I'd want to get to the, the, the thought of, there has always been something. And then the question is, what is that something? Is it our physical universe? Is it um, maybe a sort of, sort of multiversal thing or whatever else? Or is the thing that's eternal actually a, a mind, an agent, a form? I'm sure you guys are familiar with, the, with, with uh, William Lane Craig's Kalam and, and that whole sort of, uh, sure. you know. The, prob- that the, problem is that, the problem, Dylan, is that the Kalam Cosmo, what's the conclusion of the Kalam cosmological argument? Oh, you're testing me now. Um, that it's really easy. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. Um, the universe began to exist. Uh, therefore, the universe has a cause. Cool. That's it. Is that right? Does it tell you? Does it, does the Kalam <laughs> cosmological <laughs> argument tell you anything about the cause at all? Only that it it would be uncaused itself. Um, in, no, in theory, no, 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 no. The Kalam does not say that. You just went through almost word for word the Kalam cosmological argument. Everything that begins to exist has a cause for its existence. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause for its existence. The Kalam doesn't say anything at all about the nature or uh, ontology of that cause in the slightest. That's all stuff that gets added by other inferences. Now, if we have no ability to investigate the local presentation of our universe earlier than the Planck time. How could we ever okay. say what the cause could be? Yeah, I, I think you would, you would be, I think that's going back to something I said earlier. I think you'd be at that jumping off point of having to come to a conclusion based on the presented evidence. And, um, no. you'd be taking a leap towards one con- either the deity conclusion or some other materialistic uh, explanation. Yeah. So here, here's the, thank you. This is the damning end of your line of reasoning, because first of all, no, you don't have to make a conclusion. You can say there is insufficient information here and I'm going to reserve judgment and not take a leap of faith or a leap of irrationality towards a, a conclusion, because that way is the result of bias. That way is me trying to foster off my ignorance and pretend that I know something. Instead, 
I will just say, I do not know what the explanation is for the origin of the expansion of our local state of the universe. And all of the people who are asserting that they do know have failed to meet their burden of proof. And some of them are going down a path of magic that is absolutely absurd when you consider the implications. Why is this powerful being that they're hypothesizing who somehow manages to exist outside of time, which is a logical contradiction, how is that not only reasonable, but how is it that you, they think this God can present empirical evidence, does present empirical evidence, but we're just not going to waste any time on the actual empirical evidence for God. Instead, we're going to go with some weird inference where when science breaks down in our investigation of the origins of the universe, we'll just make shit up. So I, I think you, I think you lost me there with the. Um, can, I'm sorry. Can you just kind of maybe sum up the the, the question part that the, what what you want me to respond to in that? What method do you have to explore the origin of the universe beyond the Planck time? <laughs> uh, I don't. Um, I I I don't have. A, Are you reaching that, a conclusion? That. Are you reaching a conclusion about that state of affairs before the Planck time? Yes. Yes. But, why would, would you reach a conclusion? Why would you reach a con why would you reach a conclusion when you admit you have no mechanism with which to investigate the state of affairs? Well, I, I want to I want to affirm something you said that that it's I'd it's like not an answer to that question. I, I would agree with you. Right, right, right. I I just, just want to say that this it's not it's, it's a conclusion. It's not a definitive statement of I was there and I know. The answer to your question would be Dylan. For me, Dylan, that, did that, I say, uh, Dylan, did I say that your conclusion had anything to do with you being there and knowing? No, no. Did not I at say all. anything? No, um, did I say anything remotely like that? Then why did you bring that up? All I've asked is: Are you advocating reaching a conclusion about a state of affairs that you also admit you have no method to investigate? Yes or no? I feel like that question doesn't um, cover the what, what I what I would speak to is. I feel um, like that's I the believe... biggest dodge I've heard today. It's a yes or no question. <laughs> you are either right, advocating. Like you are either you are either advocating for reaching a conclusion about a state of affairs that you admit you don't have any way to explore, or you're not. Which is it? Those are the only two uh -huh. possibilities. Either you are advocating for reaching a conclusion about a state of affairs that you say you can't investigate, or you are not advocating for reaching a, state, a conclusion about a state of affairs that you're going to investigate. That is a, an exhaustive, logical dichotomy. Yeah, if you're talking about me physically investigating, then, then yes, I'm advocating for that. But I would, I would say there's something that can come to me in the form of revelation from the being who was there prior to that time, who has interacted with people in history, um, which kind of takes us back to the prior wouldn't, wouldn't claims that regarding the authenticity of the Bible. Why wouldn't that count as your mechanism for exploring that? Like, uh, well, I, for example, I, I, for I, example, I don't know, I don't necessarily know um, how the, the, the motor in a uh, electric vehicle works, but if I had a friend who was the engineer who designed it, my method for investigating right. that would be to be able to bring that friend who designed it in to explain it. Um, you're essentially saying that you have the friend who designed it able to reveal stuff to you while you're simultaneously saying you don't have a way to explore this. Right. Why, why isn't that mechanism good enough? No, no, I think it is. I, I assumed you meant a materialistic um, method. I thought, or, or a, you know, Something more a real one. Direct. <laughs> uh, no, uh, um, sorry, but no, I, I just okay. um, no. I, where, I just where's your designer? Where, where is your designer, and is he going to reveal anything to us the way he's revealed it to you? Uh, to be clear, I'm not advocating for personal divine revelation. Again, I'm speaking to the scripture uh, itself. What um, other revelation so, is there other than personal divine revelation? How do you uh, revelation is necessarily first person? I mean, we Hume raised that centuries ago. Yeah, no, I just mean like I'm not hearing God speak to me in an audible voice saying, 
Dylan, this is how things happen. But no, but but reading the scripture, there's a, a conclusion being come to. That, that's the so the so point once again, we're back to something Paul said, which is you believe a storybook. Well, I, I would say I believe historical uh, records and documentation. What what confirmed historical documentation are you pointing to? Because Genesis is not history. Well, well again, I, I would speak to the, even if Genesis isn't historical in the sense that we would say, at the very least, it could be a sort of, um, oh, I forget the title, but, but, um, but the sort of uh, historical record mixed into uh, sort of the cultural uh, story. You mean, but, you but mean case, mytho history? Is that the word you were looking for? Yeah, that's um, yeah. And, but, how do you tell? The, wh- how do you but, tell? How do you tell which verses in Genesis are mythical and which ones are history? That's a great question, um, and it's something yeah. that I'm not I'm not familiar with. So I would have to look into that kind of thing more. So were yeah, the Canaanites? So, were the Canaanites just? The Canaanites had the Enuma Elish, which is virtually the same story, right, as Genesis 1. Um, uh, did, they have, did they also have a divine revelation uh, of how the, the universe was created out of the body of another god? Well, I, would, I would say that that, that differs from the, from the Genesis. Like, unless I, unless no, I, no, I, no. I read think, read the Enuma Elish and then read Genesis 1. They are the same okay, stories with is, some details swapped. Yeah, the details swapped is where I would I would kind of hone in on. I'm not saying so there's that, not no, but, sense but, of so that so, so you have an answer to Matt's question then. How do you tell which are the real parts and which are the myth parts? How do you tell? Well, I think I think what you're asking would get me into a sort of circular reasoning that for the Bible tells me so. Um, but, That's not our problem. Um, That's your problem. Right. No, no. But but that but that wouldn't be where, where I would would go. I, but um, but I can also admit to you that I don't know what in the Hebrew text or what other scholars have kind of gotten to to discern for themselves why uh, the parts that they would separate out or which parts would would be held in common and, and that sort of thing. Well, but this is why me, you believe. Let me try. <laughs> this is weird. Let me, let me let me try kind of a side question here. Would you say sure. that like? Neil deGrasse Tyson is an expert on cosmological origins. I mean, I, I don't know a lot about him, but I, that's probably sure. Why not? Like, yeah. Okay. Let's what do you think that. the likelihood is that Neil deGrasse Tyson is going to use the Bible as a history book revealing the origin of the universe? Based on what I know about him, probably next to none. Cool. Why is he wrong then? Well, I don't think it's wrong to have a, a multiplicity of approaches to to come into an answer to a question. And I think you, to, Matt, think, to Matt's point do you earlier, think somebody like do you think somebody like Neil deGrasse Tyson um, wants to use the best methods for investigating reality? And if so. Why is he not willing to use the same methods you are using? I would guess because he's looking for something, like we talked about earlier, that would be 100% empirically proven, or as, as much as that is within the, within the sort of materialistic uh, possibility. And I think because divine revelation, in particular the Bible, would be rejected by so many, he's looking for things that can be peer-reviewed, repeated, um, and, and those sorts of things. He, he would be not in that realm of sort of the historical analysis and, and that kind of thing. How about Galileo? Did Galileo use Genesis for any of his discoveries? I, Definitely I a Christian you'd guy. About that one. Yeah, I mean, you'd, you'd have to tell me. I, I, I'm not uh, overly familiar. Well, Galileo, I mean, among his things was he, you know, he discovered that the, the the Earth went around the Sun instead of the way around, if I'm remembering correctly, um, and a lot of other discoveries. Uh, definitely a Christian man who was persecuted by the Church for deigning to mm-hmm. say that the Earth was not the center of the universe. Um, he right. discovered a right. lot of discovered a lot of things. Definitely a Christian. Definitely was you know out there wanting to 
discover God's thoughts after him. Um, mm -hmm. But do you think that he used the book of Genesis for any of these discoveries? Probably not. Uh, but yeah, Should they? Probably not. Should they have? I, I mean, I don't know that, that Genesis goes into, I mean, it, it, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but I don't know that it goes into all the cosmological machinations that would have brought those kinds of things about. Like, the you know, Genesis doesn't talk about atoms or molecules or, you know, um, isn't it, those sorts isn't of it things. Your, isn't it your primary source for reaching the conclusion that God created the universe? The, the Bible overall, um, but not necessarily focused strictly on Genesis. I, to me, the, cool. the resurrection. What, what, where, else does it, where else does the Bible talking about God creating the universe? Well, I mean, uh, a little in Job, but it's <laughs> similar. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and I think you get a little bit um, in, in the New Testament that um, it talks about God created uh, for whom are all things and, and Jesus through whom all things were created. Nothing was created except through him. Um, and, and so, but to me, the, the centerpiece would be the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so if, if that claim whoa, is, whoa, 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 is whoa, whoa. true, Whoa, then... whoa, whoa, whoa. You're saying that this, rather than going to Genesis, where it expressly talks about God creating the world in seven days and going through all the details and putting things down in an order, you think the central confirmation that God created the universe is the New Testament story about Jesus. So a person who you've already acknowledged not, may not necessarily be divine, for which you have no empirical evidence, for which you have nothing but a story, and you think this is the prime source for concluding that God created the universe? Well, I think that if you affirm that, then the reliability of the Bible, uh, the things that Jesus affirmed, you would also affirm because if, if somebody pulls off well, yes. what, what he did. Dylan, congratulations you, on your tautology. Uh, if you believe it, you believe it. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. I, I uh, used to affirm this stuff too. Right. And then I understood what good evidence is what flawed reasoning is, what fallacies are, and why scientists don't go to the Bible to talk about the origin of the universe. They also don't go to the Bhagavad Gita. They don't go to the Scientology, to Dianetics. They don't go to any of these. Do, do you know why? Because they're insufficient to the task, and yet it is your primary source. Why on earth should anybody take a flawed model based on a storybook over science. I, I, well, I would say that's a, a false dichotomy. I think that the, the Bible would deal with the origin being from a creator and science would seek to flesh out the machinations through which that creator worked in bringing about. No, um, no, no. This is, this is the same old tired misrepresentation that science asks why, how questions and religion asks why questions. No, they're all, they're all what questions. And the question is, what is the explanation for the origin of the universe? That's the what question. You're answering it with the explanation for the origin of the universe is God and your primary source is Jesus. And scientists are looking at this and saying, we don't yet have enough information to say what is the origin of the universe, or even if that question makes sense because there may not be an origin of the universe, because the universe may have always existed and all we're looking at is an expansion of that universe, a change in the state of that universe, just like no atoms that became me had to come into existence. Every atom that is a part of my body already existed. It's not like we're inventing new atoms here. And so the scientists are acting in humility and saying, you know what? We don't have sufficient reason to reach a conclusion about the, an explanation for the origin of the universe, but you are. And when asked how and why you reach the conclusion, your first, well, I won't necessarily say first, one of your lines was, hey, you reach a point where science can't go any further and you have to make a decision. You are wrong there. You do not have to make a decision.
That's why science doesn't. And then you yeah. went on to be right, right. in this, oh, the things that I would point to are all these things that I believe about the Bible, and I think there's empirical evidence for it, but I'm not going to get into that or present that. I'm just going to tell the story. Why would anyone believe the story? Yeah, well, and again, I, I want to, like, what you talked about of, you, I, you're right, you don't, you don't have to draw a conclusion. You could stay in sort of a, you know, I, I don't know, and, that, and, and sort of to be comfortable in that space. Um, for, for me, I it's choose got nothing to go to, with, to a, a conclusion. Yeah, it's got nothing to do with comfort, and it's got nothing to do with choosing. I can't believe anything unless I am convinced that it's actually true. And I'm not going to just accept a just-so story without sufficient evidence to warrant it. But isn't it the right answer? Like if I said, Dylan, do you know how the universe began? What's the right answer? No, the answer is no. Cool. So if you and I both, when asked, do you know how the universe began, would, would think that the correct answer is no, why are you advocating for another answer? Because I believe I have good reason to draw a conclusion, not a definitive one, not a I know for sure, not a absolutely, but a but good reason. Um, okay. To what is your good reason? A, what is your good reason be, other than I read mm -hmm. a storybook? Yeah. Again, we kind of we kind of revisited. I, I know we draw different conclusions, and, and actually, I thought it was a good point you made about the Kalam. Um, that technically the cause of the universe could be some other cause, cause, or, or if I understood you correctly. Um, but but I, I kind of go to, in a very basic way, um, that based on the complexity, the sort of, I guess you would call it, and again, I'm not super well versed in these, these names, but um, like the fine tuning, the sort of design um, arguments, all those sorts of things um, seem to point to an, an ordered, um, cause of the universe rather than a um, arbitrary or um, loosely constructed uh, reason. And hey, Dylan? So that kind of gets you to... To be, to be clear, Dylan? Yeah. <laughs> arbitrary and loosely defined, that's not the God, God one? Or that is the God one? <laughs> um, well, I, I think I didn't <laughs> even say that, that that's pretty clearly defined. Um, at least really? Wow. Biblically speaking. Uh, over a thousand denominations of Christianity disagree, and then there's all the other proclaimed things, and then there's the God of classical theism, which is just um, de defined loosely as this omni-something. Um, but y you're sitting here and you're like, well, I, no, I got, I got sidetracked there, so I'll just hold off. I'm sorry, Matt. No, it's fine. It's not your fault. Uh, Dylan, you quoted... John chapter one. I'm not sure you knew you're quoting John chapter one, but you quoted John chapter one saying, which okay. is the portion of the new Testament that says that Jesus was there in the beginning. Right now. Sure. What yeah. in John chapter one, did Jesus himself say? He doesn't, he doesn't speak there. That's, that's uh, John's yeah. kind of introduction. Right. To the, to the book. So Jesus, did Jesus ever claim that he was part of the creation process? In the um, in the Gospels, uh, not maybe in those words per se. You, you get the John eight fifty eight before Abraham was I am so sort of a a pre existence. John seventeen he gives the um, before the foundation restore the glory to me but that we shared before the foundation of the world. So so he talks about being there before the right. foundation of the right. world. So um, so so I'm just so I, I'm just trying to say the justification you're giving in the like the the Bible is what tells you, again, you're putting your weight on the commentary about Jesus that happened 80 years after he was gone, not even Jesus himself. Like you're, you're, I just wanted to give you that little bit of homework to go investigate. Uh, it sounds like you've done it a little bit that, you know, yeah. you're not only just yeah. stories, <laughs> you're, you're now, t you're now relying on the commentary about stories, uh, even, even more so. Uh, can I just ask you to maybe flesh that? What, when you say commentary on stories, what are you uh, what are you making reference to? The author of the Gospel of John. Okay. The whole intro, the word became flesh stuff. 
Right. That that's not that's not in quotations. He's not saying this is what Jesus said. He's just narrating his version. Okay. okay. He's come up you. with his own you. theology during since since the passing of Jesus. They've had at least fifty years for for John something a lot longer uh, to to come up with a theology and, and a their own Christian origin story. What you've got there is a commentary. Um. Not even Jesus' not even allegedly Jesus' words. I'm just it, that kind of struck me as weird yeah, that you were saying that Jesus was your source. That Jesus was your source, and I just wanted to point out to you that you're actually even a even if you accept this all at face value, you're a step removed. So that was all. That's a weird side comment. <laughs> and no, no, and, no, but but and, and yeah, no, thank you for for uh, you know trying to clarify that. I, but yeah, to me, I would just and again, we don't need to stay on this. I just. The John 17 passage of, of Jesus saying before the foundation of the earth implies he was there. And I guess it's not him specifically saying, hey, you know, I, I created everything. But I think it could it certainly leans in that direction if he was there before the foundation of the earth. And again, you're talking about that's granting. And I know you don't maybe uh, grant the face value um, reliability or even the, the authorship of, it, it, of the it's gospels. Worse and, and sorts of things. It, it, it's worse than that, because you're looking at John 17. And sure. you, like a lot of other people, seem to have uh, put an emphasis on the fact that Bibles often come in a red letter version, as if what's written there is an accurate representation of what Jesus actually said, and that that what I don't know what that background noise is, but and whether or not it's accurate is independent from whether or not it's true. Now, Dylan, have you? ever taken notes in a class in high school, college, whatever? <laughs> Probably very brief bullet point notes, but, but yes. Yeah, uh, I, I have two. Um, I don't tend to write mm -hmm. down every word. And it mm -hmm. would be a mistake for me to walk out of a classroom or a lecture and mm -hmm. take my notes and write down and pretend that I've written down everything that the professor said word for word and that I got it all and understood it all. And it would also be, I mean, it's possible because I could use my phone to record and we have recording devices now, but how right. accurate is someone going to be standing outside in the first century without pen and paper in taking notes on every word that Jesus said? I mean, it would probably vary based on the time from the event, uh, you know, who's the person, how good's their memory. Um, obviously, if you factored in the supernatural claims of the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, things of that nature. Ah, um, and, and, but I'm, I'm trying so, to, so, I'm trying so, to speak no, 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 Hang on. Yeah. It's interesting that in order to try to show that there's good reason to think that it's an accurate representation of what was said, you have to begin and include an assumption that there is some being working to guarantee that it's reliable. No, I, I wouldn't say you you have to, because again, I think you, uh, you, okay. you, I'm sure there's things that you so remember what, very what well percentage, from, from class. What percentage of the red letter text? What percentage of the red letter text will ignore translation? And we'll just assume that the English translation in ESV, NIV, King James, whatever it is, we'll assume that that's an accurate uh, representation of, of the actual words that are there. Um, but what percentage mm -hmm. of the red letters in, in the modern translation of the Bible is an accurate representation of what Jesus said? I think it would depend on the modern translation, but I would say that... Um, because what I would go back to is the sort of original text and then the investigation of textual variants and things like that. We don't have but any I would say originals. Even in, well, well, no, you, you know, the, the, as far as what is, we have textual variants through the manuscript tradition and things of that nature. And so, but we, um, don't, we don't have that, that's any why the English originals. Things a little, right, right. You know, I, so, I, I, so I, I'm we, aware. So I, we, we have no originals. And so all I'm asking is, of the red letter text that's attributed to Jesus, how accurate is it, and how can you tell? Yeah, I would say the te the manuscript tradition and the the work of textual critics would would give. So us we're a, talking about how well was the original? How, like, let's let's pretend that what we have, Matt, let's pretend what we have is a Xerox copy of the original. 
Matt's asking how well was the how can we know what that the original was accurate? Um, I would say up to a, and again, ninety eight percent, ninety nine percent of the the manuscript tradition we can through textual criticism get. No, very no, no, not to, talking about. You're talking about whether the copies are accurate. We're asking. Oh, I'm sorry. How yeah, well no, we can I, know that the original that. was accurate. Um. I guess I, I, I guess there wouldn't I guess there wouldn't be like a sort of definitive sense. You, once you know what the text most likely said in the original, um, you, you're simply trying to analyze who wrote it, where were they, how long after the fact, um, and, and that would be kind of how you would sort of try to I guess work your way to how reliable the original is. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, how accurate? Are, are the red letter things to what Jesus actually said? And the answer is, you don't know. Um, but here's the weird thing. You think there's a God, and that this God, through the Holy Spirit, worked to reliably preserve accurately the words of Jesus, right? Sure, yeah. Why? Why? Would that God not actively work to preserve the originals so that we don't have this gap and have to rely on textual criticism to try and infer what the originals said? Why would this God who's actively working to preserve the words of Jesus not have had Jesus write down his own words, sign it, and preserve it? The first question. Why? Um, why would that same God not show up today to clarify it? If God is working to preserve this, which is an essential aspect of your model and is the only hope any of you have of, of claiming any accuracy to what Jesus actually wrote, why hmm. is he doing it in the weakest way possible? Yeah, I mean, I, I would. We'd be getting into speculation there. Um, I mean, I, I I'm not the one who believes this shit. Of course, it's speculation. I'm calling you out for speculating. Yeah, I mean, in the you're comfortable saying I don't know to certain questions. I'm comfortable saying I don't know to certain questions, and and so. But no, um, sir. No, sir. No, sir. It's not about saying you're un. You're comfortable saying I don't know. You believe something that is in absolute sure. contradiction with other things you believe the natural consequences of a god trying to make sure that jesus's words are accurately preserved is not making sure that the originals don't exist and that we have copies of copies of translations of copies that all say different things and no way to investigate it that is not a being that is working to preserve the words a being that is working to preserve the words would have had jesus write down his own words, sign it, and preserve those, and if anybody tried to eliminate those, would show up to clarify this so that I don't have to sit here and explain this over and over and over again for 20 years to people who think that just because they read it in a book that other people believed, it's therefore reasonable. Yeah, I would just say I think you're, you're kind of jumping in terms of your your assumption of of god's intentions motives or or i didn't assume know, god's intentions dylan i asked you i asked you if you were reliant on god's intention to preserve the words jesus and you said yes right right but 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 the the whole concept of you know if so uh he would then make sure that you know the the original copy was still around, and he'd he'd come back and clarify and all that other sort of stuff. Um, Why wouldn't he do that? Like, wouldn't wouldn't you do that really, if it was important? It wouldn't you do that if you were God? It really depends on what my intentions. Are. I, I'm not God, thanks, thankfully, but but the you know uh, <laughs> it depends um, on the intentions. On Correct, the, Dylan, and you already acknowledge that God's intention is to accurately preserve the words of Jesus, right? Sure. If God's intention is to accurately preserve the words of Jesus, why is he not using the most reliable methods to preserve that word? 
I guess, I guess I would ask what, what, what is the most reliably? I just um, told you the that the method. most reliable method is to have Jesus write down those words, sign it, and then establish a chain of custody of the original from the moment that happened until now. Can God do that? Sure. It, it, then why doesn't he? The, I, I actually would, because that actually sounds a lot like, and I'm not, please don't, I, I don't, mean any sort of like uh calling out on this but just because that sounds like a, a controlled transmission of the text very similar to the sort of case that that muslims make in regards to the quran i actually like the, the new testament's free transmission the, the multiple scribes we have a textual variant but i like the multiplicity of authors and that's because you're grossly that's because you're rationalizing countries. that's because you're rationalizing dylan and you you have sitting here you <laughs> cannot acknowledge you cannot acknowledge that there's a better way and then say ah, i like the fact that god didn't take the better way i like the fact that we have copies of copies of translations of copies i like the fact that there's absolute confusion about what the originals said and, and how reliable it is we have no way to investigate it i don't really think those muslims that are that are advocating a a strong chain of evidence are are anywhere near on as strong a footing as we are that's absolute bullshit. i mean there's just no other way to describe that. There are methods that are reliable and methods that are not. And you think simultaneously you hold in your head that God wants to be reliable, but God failed to be reliable. And then you rationalize it as better in your head while admitting that it's not better. Yeah, I, I would argue if there was such a controlled transmission, like a, a signed by Jesus, all that sort of stuff. Here it comes. I think there would still be claims to um, the, uh, the the church manipulating or behind closed yes. doors altering or editing. Or we got there, ladies and gentlemen. We got there that even if God, in his infinite power and wisdom, used the most reliable ways, it would be a waste of his time because those pesky atheists would still just not believe it. That's that is the we're done, Dylan. We're gonna we're gonna go on to other callers because you just walked yourself into the I'm going to put up a denial block at all costs because God Himself could walk in here today and hand Matt the handwritten copy from Jesus and affirm it, but Matt would still just be too fucking stubborn, and that's why God doesn't use the best methods because the best methods wouldn't matter anyway. That's the most gross, ridiculous rationalization that turns your entire foundation into a cartoon. But thanks. All right. Well, yeah, thank you guys for your time. See ya. I knew we would get there. It is, every time we'd start talking about, hey, can you present actual evidence for this? Eventually, and some get there much quicker, Eventually, somebody goes, why would God bother giving you evidence? You just won't believe it anyway. And that is the absolute, that is an entire bottle of copium that Dylan just swallowed. Um, because the reality is, I'll believe anything for which there's sufficient evidence. And if, in fact, there is a God who has sufficient evidence and is capable of presenting sufficient evidence to me, it has not happened. And now they have to explain why. And it's because God knows that I just wouldn't believe it, despite the fact that I used to believe exactly what they believe for the same silly reasons they do. So they, they think that I used to believe for bad reasons, but God won't give me good reasons because I still won't believe. And yet one of the best things that a God could do is not to, you know, blow myself, but... I have content that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people have seen. And the best thing God could do is show up and present that good evidence so that they could prove to everybody, see, I told you, here's the amazing, undeniable evidence. And Matt and these other atheists still won't accept it. And yet that doesn't explain why God doesn't do it for all the other people who would honestly accept if there was good evidence. They twist themselves into knots, trying to avoid the obvious fact that if prayer worked, it wouldn't be allowed in casinos. If God existed, 
you wouldn't have to argue about it. If the Bible were reliable, there would be no way for any reasonable person to not accept it. If, in fact, there was a God, spectral evidence would be allowed in a court of law. If, in fact, the Bible was history and if the Bible was scientifically reliable, astrophysicists would have been using it to confirm aspects of Genesis from the moment it was written. Instead, it's about a bunch of sheep herders who want to take multiple wives, slaughter the people who don't agree with them, tell stories about how wonderful and great they are, despite not being able to defeat chariots of iron with a god, and then do some kind of tap dance about how we have a reliable account of God coming down, impregnating someone um, so that he can incarnate himself as a version of himself to act as a sacrifice to serve as a loophole for rules that he's in charge of. But I'm the one that's a stubborn cynic who just won't accept that good evidence from God. It's wild. Hey, Paul, you want to learn how to experience God? I, I, that's all I want. Sweet. Richard in Birmingham is here to tell us how to experience God. Okay. So, um, I heard you just say to him that you want to, do you want to learn how to experience God? Did you say the word learn? Yes, please. Well, it, it just says here me? that you're, it just says the topic here is how to experience God. Are you able to show us how to experience God? Uh, I can tell you how I experience God. And then maybe you'll get a better uh, view of how. I mean, there's a certain way to approach something, right? And if you don't approach it properly, you won't get the answers that you need. <laughs> you have to uh, excuse me because I'm a bit nervous. <clears throat> now, what I mean is... The way you approach something matters. You can you see in life, you try to approach somebody and you will not get what you want. So this is my point about how you approach it. Now, it's funny you said to your, your your friend there. Now, please excuse me. I am I feel, I am so honoured to be on your show. Honestly, I've, I've watched it so many times, and I'm I'm in awe of your. Okay, I muted you, Richard. Uh, I need you to do me a favor. Um, there's some kind of weird audio click that's coming through when you're talking. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, I don't need you to tell us how honored you are to be here or how difficult or how you have to approach things and blah, blah, blah repeatedly. I just need you to discuss information that's potentially useful to all of us about how to experience God. That's it. And, and keep in mind that both Matt and I experienced things that we thought at the time were God. Go ahead. Okay. So, let me tell you what happened to me. Right? In, in 2010, 2000, end of 2009, I went to prison, and I ended up getting five years for that, for that sentence. And I was a heroin addict, and I was still on methadone. I hadn't took heroin for six months, but I had took crack. I used to inject it. I hope it's okay to say this. I think we're all adults here. Right, so I was, I was a methadone addict at that time. I'd been a heroin and crack addict for 10 years, right? So I went to prison in 2009, right? It, it, I was still in prison in 2011. I didn't get out till 2012, halfway through my sentence, right? So in October, no, in 2011, on, on April the 8th, yeah, on April the 8th, 2011, right? Something culminated over that. Uh, something happened that that was a culmination of, of a period of time. Right, I'd given up smoking for forty days. I, I, ha I hadn't smoked a cigarette. Right, this one night, <clears throat> I borrowed my a Bible off, the, off my my mate next door. It was this fan, awesome Bible had an index in the back, and I was really interested in what words meant because I'm quite smart. So. I opened this Bible about 10 o'clock at night and I read it 
I, I didn't read it, the book. I looked in this index on words, and I wrote all these notes down, right? And my, my main worry was that I wasn't going to see my son go to school, right, because he was coming to five. And I never said that to God, but he answered it for me. I can't remember how it happened, but I, I, I found out that there's a type of, um, there's kind of a law where kids are not responsible for themselves till they're seven. So I thought, okay, he's, he's in your hands. I'll give him over to you, yeah? And I felt better about it. And then, right, at about five o'clock in the morning, right, I've been doing all these notes all night. About five o'clock in the morning, I, I, I opened my heart and I said, God, the reason why I don't believe in you is because I'm afraid. I'm afraid for my kids and I'm afraid of what he says in the Bible, right? I got up. And I baptised myself in the sink. I said, I baptise you. And I said my name in the name of God. And I sat down, right, in the lotus position on the bed, right? Instantly, right, instantly, the room started to change in front of me, right? Was I no drugs or was sober? And I, I wasn't even tired because I'd been up all night. Going to sleep was over. For, I, I didn't care about sleep. I mean, because I'd been up all night. It, the room started to change once in my eyes. It was tripping. I took acid, but this was not like acid. It was a million times better. It was so unbelievable that I, that I stopped looking like that because I was like, what's going on? I couldn't believe my eyes, right? And I looked away. And I thought to myself, I've got to, I hope you can still hear me. <laughs> I, 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 I thought to myself, I've got to be mature about this. Something's happening, right? So I continued to look forward, and the room started to change again. It started to go, some like, like a palace or something. I couldn't describe what it, what was what it was looking like, but but I, I started to feel super heavy as well. Like a lot of people think, didn't, didn't you feel light and fluffy? No, I felt super heavy, like I was melting into in, into everything, right? And, and, I stood, and I sat there staring at it for about 15 seconds and I saw this light at the corner of my eye. I did not look at it, but as soon as I became aware of this, the whole room went brighter as day, brighter than anything I've ever seen, and it absolutely blew me away. I've been clean now, yeah, for over 10 years. Nine, nine years I've been clean, right? Because of this, what happened to me, all the problems I have in my life, I always think back to that, and and that and that thing is 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 what is what changed my life. After that, right, I told I told my mate about it. who used to meditate. He was into meditation, and and I was really open to anything at that time because so I, I, my, my my whole life had just been like it had been totaled, and my heart was so happy. I I, I laughed for a whole week. They sent me to a nut house, right? Because I told them what happened to me in the prison. And, the, and, and, and I thought they thought I was acting a bit strange, right? So they sent me to the nut house, right, at another prison. And I saw a psychiatrist, and, uh, and, he, and he said, uh, do you want to go to this nut house, right, so, uh, in Birmingham? Really? And I said, yeah, okay, I'll go there. He came back a, a week later. The psychologist asked you if you, you wanted to go to the nut house. house. Okay. How, what how are we supposed to do with this story, yeah, Richard? He, he, yeah. What are we supposed to do with I'm, this story? I'm trying to explain how to you how. No. I'm trying to explain to you how to be a receiver so that you can. No, you're you're, you're telling us you're if telling you us what happened, how. and it's getting it's getting very long. You're 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 telling us very little about the how. I'm telling you um. that I prayed to God, right, and He answered my prayer, and I've been okay. clean now for nine years. And if, Richard, you, and if you don't, if you don't, if, if you Richard. don't kill your ego, because Prison has got a way Richard. of destroying your ego. It takes it spits there, away who you are. What? Okay. Um, what? Do you have anything useful to tell us about how we can experience God? Because yeah. I'm saying your no, ego. No, let your me ego please let me finish. Please way. let me please let me your please ego, let me fucking please let me fucking finish my you. fucking thought, Richard. Stop talking over yeah, me. On, I sit here and listen to you. Go for it. Let me shut up. I'd like something about right, how I get. Talk to me like that all the time, so. 
All right, I've muted you so that I don't have to yell at you. My apologies. <clears throat> I, I have questions that I'd like to ask you, Richard, but you won't shut up long enough for me to get a thought out. Um, so I guess what I'm going to have to do is mute you like this, then unmute you when I've asked a question to get an answer, and then mute you again. Richard, do you think that I have talked to God? Do I think you've talked to God? Is that what you asked me? Yes. Why is it? Oh, my God. If you can't get through the first fucking question. Okay. So are you able to have a conversation or not? Can I ask you a question at all? No, you can't ask, ask me a question because I just asked you a question. You could barely put together the, the, the ability to restate the question and then didn't answer it. So I'm going to ask it again. And yes, I can have a conversation, which I've proved over and over again. I'm not the one with a problem with a conversation here, Richard, which I've already demonstrated today. So let me ask my question again. Do you think I have tried speaking to God? Uh, yeah, I do. Cool. So, what did I what do wrong, think? and how do you? What did I do wrong, and how do you know that I did it wrong? You're approach. You're approach. I don't know that you did. I don't know how you did it. I just know you're approach. Then I don't care wrong. what you have to say. Goodbye. You're not going to call in and suggest that we need to kill our ego, or that you found the way to talk to God, and the rest of us just don't. That's some arrogant fucking bullshit. That's some monumentally arrogant bullshit that everybody else who wasn't delivered from heroin while stuck in prison having incredible experiences that they have no way of demonstrating are from God. Those are the people who've learned this important lesson about how to communicate with God. And the rest of us are just somehow sinful, prideful, whatever else. Um, here's what you need to do. Go ask God what God wants you to say to us, and don't call back until you get the answer, because I'm never interested in hearing from you again, but I am interested in hearing from God. And if you think you have a message for me from God, I'll take that. But if you're just going to tell your story and then absolutely fail to address the first question that somebody asks you, and then act like we're the ones that don't know how to have a conversation, you're not welcome here. Alonzo, hey, calling doing? from Illinois. You are live with Paul and Matt. Awesome. It's great to be on with you. Um, basically, uh, the title of the YouTube video is, Is Faith Rational? And basically, when uh, I saw that question, I... Are you uh -oh. still there? Did you mute? Am I muted? No. Nope. So now, now I hear you. Now we hear you. Okay, we missed what you said after a YouTube video. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Uh, your YouTube video is titled "Is Faith Rational?" And so the question that I had was, how are you using uh, the words "faith" and "rational"? What do you mean by that? Um, sure. Yeah. Faith is, the, faith is the excuse people give for believing something when they don't have a good reason. And rational is when a position is consistent with the facts of reality as we understand it. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Paul, uh, are you using kind of that same uh, definition? I would use the same definition for rational. I never attempt mm -hmm. to use the definition of faith because mm -hmm. I have yet to come across two people who use it in the same way. So I am always happy to let the other person define what faith means in the conversation. Okay. okay. Awesome. Awesome. So, but I didn't um, make a video about me, it like Matt did. So in Matt's video, no, he would have had I didn't to make a video it. about it either. It's oh. literally the title of this episode that oh, neither right. oh, one gotcha. of us had anything to do with. Oh, I understand. I understand. I understand. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No worries. No worries. So um, I think for me, uh, rational is giving reasons. Um, there, I'd probably add good reasons to that, but there's a lot of you know confusion about what is good reasons, what isn't. Does that make sense? And then how I use the word faith is you know trust and confidence. 
Did that make sense? Uh, kind of that where that is. Okay. Now yeah, that, there's two. That's going to be a problem. Can... Yeah. Because so how do you because mean that? I I have trust and confidence in great many things that is based on evidence. Mm -hmm. I don't have faith in anything. Right. right. Okay. So. But, yeah, I, and, I'm saying that and, and because you faith, faith in that way that faith is an excuse. Um, that makes complete sense to me. Well, that makes complete I, sense you, you can throw out you can throw out the excuse if mm -hmm. if I ask somebody why do you believe this, and somebody says I take it on faith, mm -hmm. that is them saying that faith is the epistemological foundation for their belief. And when I ask, what do they mean by that? That's when we get into how they're using faith. Because if I sit in a chair, I'm not exercising <laughs> faith. I have a trust or a confidence in the, in the absence of absolute certainty, and it's based on right. evidence. And I can explain with <laughs> actual <laughs> empirical evidence why I trust this chair. Uh, I have yet okay. in 20 years of doing this to meet anyone who can do that for why they believe there's a God. Yeah. Okay. So the way that I uh, I'm I'm using the word tends to be uh, kind of that same sense in which you're sitting in the chair. Okay. Okay. So, then, um, for, so yeah. are you suggesting Sorry? that you have evidence for God? Uh, I'm not here to discuss the evidence. I'm trying to get to the bottom of why. Well, um, no. You know, we would answer this question differently. Does that make sense? So, I, I you just said that you would answer the question in the same way that I would answer mm -hmm. it about the chair. And so if well, I was asked why I have confidence in a chair, I would present the evidence. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. you're suggesting that you have evidence for God then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's plenty of, um, you know, ways that people have attempted to give reasons um, for theism. Um, and like I said, I'm not here to, um, basically be like okay cool here's evidence x y and z if that makes sense so you're you're I'm not you have to... you have no interest you have no interest in justifying your position with evidence yeah. um not in this conversation in this conversation then I don't, what I'm I, don't, to I don't have any I don't have any I don't have any interest I don't have any interest in carrying on the conversation then Alonzo okay it, well it was I have one question for Alonzo though Alonzo Paul. Alonzo What's the most famous passage in the Bible about faith? So um, it would probably be Hebrews 10 something. 11 sorry. 11 it, one. Yeah, 11 one. I'm sorry. Hebrews 11, the whole chapter. It's, it's like the summary of the Old yeah. Testament. It's great. Uh, yeah, can, oh, do yeah, you have, amazing. Do you have the Bible yeah, handy? Uh, do, you, do you know Hebrews mm -hmm. 11, 1 and 2? Can you, can you give, that, give that to us? Just give me one second while I grab my Bible real quick. Uh, how about if I read it? Can I read it? I'll just read it. So um, now faith is confidence no, in what we hope for. Mm -hmm. Can I? Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Mm -hmm. uh, does Can you understand why mm -hmm. when someone like myself or Matt reads the Bible, that we look mm -hmm. at a passage like that, mm -hmm. and we and when it specifically says faith is assurance about what we do not see, and we, mm -hmm. we don't mean to get literally, we just mean mm -hmm. faith is what plugs that assurance gap for things that for mm -hmm. things uh, about God that we can't know. Um, yeah. can you see why someone like Matt or I, when we read the Bible, that yeah, we you want read to read those two verses? Yeah, sure. Or, um, on the other hand, now, do, would you be like, uh, sorry, Alonzo? No, like, do you understand that, that a lot of Christians mm -hmm. are happy to live in that space, whether or not yeah, Matt and I are? I'll be honest. I, I, I'll be honest. I I don't feel like I'm happy to live in a space where faith is just this kind of nebulous, um, you know. Oh, oh! I I just believe it because I believe it. No, I want to have reason for what I believe. Okay. You know. So, and so what is if the you look at Hebrews say eleven seven, where 
um, the author of Hebrews is giving an example, what we read is, by faith, Noah, when warned about things not seen, in godly fail, built an ark to save his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness that comes by faith. Now, what we see here is that Noah had been warned, okay? He, and the faith he has is he is trusting that warning, which to me, right. so that, Alonzo, that's an evidence-based thing. Does that make sense? But, 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 I understand, but, yeah. so you want to say, I know you want to say that trust is a component of faith, and I'm actually fine with that, mm -hmm. yeah. but trust and faith cannot be pure synonyms, right? Even based on the Bible, we, we, have, we have a way to say trusting in evidence, or trust mm -hmm. and evidence, and faith is mm -hmm. a separate thing. Otherwise, we don't need the word, right? Mm -hmm. Um. So... Like, yeah, I've been looking into faith and how it's used in the Bible, and I'm coming, I'm, I'm getting more and more convinced that um, faith and trust really are very, very close synonyms, and that the word that gets translated as faith in the Bible would be better translated into the current language as trust. Okay, wow. so, so then, then, then what you're saying is that we can live without the word faith? And so we, so you would agree that the weird thing that some people call faith, we don't need that at mm -hmm. all. So we, I guess I, everyone I, here I, agrees <laughs> that we don't. Yeah. That faith is faith has no uh, special part in our life. Is that what we all agree to now? I mean, if we're using faith the way Matt does, absolutely. You know, um, and no, but, I think but, that, yeah. But even if yeah, we just use yeah, it as a pure synonym for trust. And trust. You know, now, if we're going to say we're going to live our lives completely without trust, then I, I think that sounds a little bit weird. If that makes sense. But it may sound weird to your ears because you're used to using the word faith there. But right. well, I guess what we're saying, <laughs> what we're saying is if, if you want to define faith in a way that isn't the way you know the Bible mm -hmm. seems to indicate, and the way Christians a lot a lot of Christians mm -hmm. indicate. And if you want to put it in this right. purely category of entirely synonymous with trust, then I think mm -hmm. everyone here on this panel just agrees that trust has a place in our world, uh, but that faith does not, because we don't. Because you're saying you oh. you don't even need the word faith because it's purely synonymous with trust. Yeah. yeah so sure. we I think we just came to an agreement. I think we're good, right? Yeah, awesome. Well, if we're uh, in agreement that, you know, faith is trust and we kind of need trust, the question is, you know, how good are our reasons for believing what trust, uh, what uh, we trust in, you know, and how good those reasons are, I think we're good. That's yeah, what we try to do for, here every Sunday, so that's cool. Yeah. Except hey, I'm here to throw, I, except oh, that I'm here, here to throw a wrench into it. Okay. So, um, in verse 7, mm -hmm. Noah's trust was because he was warned by God, right. right? Do you or I have any such clear warning from God or any such interaction with God or any direct mm -hmm. evidence of any such interaction with God that would make mm -hmm. our trust on comparable mm -hmm. footing to Noah's? Mm -hmm. Well. There's a lot of people who would definitely say that we do, you know, and there's a lot of various apologetics. Am I I'm, talking I'm to one of those people? Because apologetic. I don't care what other people but say. I'm talking to you. you. Yeah. No, you yeah. don't get you don't get a question for me if you don't answer my question. I didn't ask you if there are people mm -hmm. out there who mm -hmm. think that this is the case. What I said is, mm -hmm. if Noah got a warning from God, mm -hmm. and that's what the foundation mm -hmm. of his trust is, he's confident mm -hmm. in this warning from God, mm -hmm. what I asked is, do either you or I have a comparable mm -hmm. evidential mm -hmm. foundation for our trust? Well, that's what I'm trying to build. I'm trying to figure out, you know, do I have? So is that, that a no? So that must be a no then, you know, because you if, know. if 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 it was a yes, you wouldn't be trying to build it, right? If God mm -hmm. if God showed up and gave you and me a warning, you wouldn't have to be building anything, right? 
No, Except maybe that's an not arc. true. So um, the reason for that is it's because not. for any belief that we have, we have to um, build up, investigate the evidence. You know, say climate change. No, if God shows up, no, no, Alonzo, if God shows up and tells me and you Mm -hmm. that there's a flood coming, we have direct Mm -hmm. information from God. Now our Mm -hmm. trust is on the same footing as Noah's. But you and I don't have any such interaction with God like that, do we? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that we don't have that direct um thing but that doesn't mean that there's you know no, you say, wouldn't say um, it but that's because you're trying to dodge the subject alonzo do you have any I'm evidence sorry. to present that you or i hmm? have ever received a direct message from noah in the way that or, or mm-hmm. a direct message from god in the way that noah did mm-hmm. that's not what i'm trying to um Proof here. I've got. I got. I, I don't I've already gotten. So all right. So I'm muting you because now you are flailing around and dodging and dancing in a ridiculous way. If I'm going to sit here and I'm going to do all the heavy lifting to try to expose the flaw in your assessment about trust, you've got to do your part too. And so if you want to say that the word faith that's being used there in that passage is merely just trust and Noah's trust was based on God directly communicating a warning to him, then it's fair for me to say, do you have any evidence that either you or I have ever had God communicate with us in the way that Noah did? That's a yes or no question. Do you have any evidence that God has interacted with you or I in the way that he supposedly interacted with Noah? Okay. So let me make sure that I'm getting the question right here. Okay? Jesus. It's, no, 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 no. It's a yes or no question. It's a yes or no question. Shut up. Shut up. It's a yes or no question that I have repeated now two or three times. I'll repeat it one more time so that you don't have to tap dance around and pretend like you haven't understood the question. Do you? have direct evidence that either you or I have received a message from God just as Noah did. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure I understand your question. Oh my fucking God, you liar. You liar. You don't need to further ask me if you can't understand that simple fucking question after I've spelled it out for you three or four fucking times, why should I bother listening to you at all? Matt. Does it hurt being this stupid? Does it hurt being this stupid, Alonzo? Um, If asking questions is stupid... Um, it is making sure that you understand the question is stupid. You, you're then, full of shit, uh, Alonzo. No, Here, Alonzo, do you mm-hmm. have direct evidence that either you or I have received a direct message from God in the way that Noah did? Mm-hmm. Yes or no? <sighs> yes yeah. or no? Yes or no? <sighs> yes or no? <laughs> how i'm understanding your question yes or no cool so you you're saying based on how you understand my question the answer is no why did it take so long to get there because you kept um yelling at me for trying to clarify the question uh no sir i didn't just keep yelling at you for attempting to clarify the question i asked a very clear question which is do you have direct evidence of God giving a message to you or me in the way that Noah does? And the answer to that is no. Okay. What was unclear? Well, so first, we have to clarify first, what kind of message did Noah receive? Let's just say it's God directly talking to him. No, we don't. No, we don't. I asked what was unclear about my question. Do, do you know what was unclear okay. about my question? Well, so, what? I want to make sure that I was understanding the question correctly. 
What, what was unclear about my question? What's unclear about your question is, um, be, be, sorry, I'm getting a little bit flustered. Um, yeah. What was unclear about your question in, uh, is, do, is, and I want to make sure I understood it, that uh, you're asking if I or you, now I honestly meant I don't know anything about you, okay? But I know about me, okay? So did, have I received the, a, a, a clear communication from God in the way that Noah has? And I want to make sure that was the, indeed the question, okay? Oh and the answer is no. What was unclear about my question? Well, I feel like I have explained the question that I was answering, and we're good at this point. Is there anything else you'd like to ask me? Not a thing, ever. Okay. Well, hey, it was great talking to you. No, it wasn't great talking to you. It was not great. This was a simple question. Because... And, and the reason that there was difficulty and the reason there was tap dancing, I suspect, although I am reluctant to say that I can actually read your mind, is because Genesis chapter 6, verses, verse 13 says, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Noah didn't exercise faith in the way that Alonzo uses the term trust in the absence of certainty. Noah got a direct message from the God of the universe about what was supposed to happen. The question that I asked is, do you have any evidence at all that you, Alonzo, or I have ever received a message like that? a direct message from the God of the universe? And the answer is an obvious no. And one of the reasons that it was so difficult to get Alonzo to actually acknowledge this is because somewhere in Alonzo's head is the recognition of, holy crap, I just tried to spell out that the Bible's use of faith is really just reasonable trust because Noah exercised faith what did Noah have? A direct communication with God. That's, that's not even in the same ballpark as you trying to argue that, well, maybe, maybe this particular Aramaic word that's being, or Greek word that's being translated as faith, maybe it just means confidence. And so I'll go through all the different instances in the Bible and try to pick out the ones that just mean confidence except that you started with the one that isn't just confidence. It's a fucking hotline to God. Give me a hotline to God, and I'll tell you how much I trust or don't trust God. The notion that you're on the same footing as Noah means you are a marketing major's wet dream. You have bought into what the Bible's trying to convince you of. There's a reason why, and I mentioned this in a, in a little bit in a recent debate, a Damascus Road experience should be good enough for all of us. Otherwise, God's playing favorites. The Doubting Thomas evidence should be presented to all of us. Otherwise, God's playing favorites. Thomas's evidential warrant for believing in the resurrection of Jesus is in a completely different reality of information than your and my warrant, which is kind right, of non-existent. But, but the Bible says, Matt, don't you know that the people who believe with less warrant in that very, yes. very same story are more blessed? Yes. The, the less warrant you have, the more blessed you are. Yeah. Theists, yeah. Christians in particular, are advocating for an all-knowing, all-wise God that doesn't understand the basic flaws of epistemology and reinforces that doubt is bad and that gullibility shall be blessed. If, that, if your God exists, 
he's either stupid or evil because that's not how you present warrant for belief in something. And what's weird is, why does that story even exist? Right. I talked about this in the resurrection debate because you have Elijah doing a resurrection and then Elisha mm -hmm. doing two of them, although one of them he did after he was dead. And then you have Jesus raising some people from the dead. And of course the stories are kind of vague. Like the Elisha one is like two sentences or one, one actual verse where they throw a body in and the body happens to touch Elisha's dead body and it comes back to life. That's a remarkable thing that surely deserves more than one verse. I mean, this is, this is the, the, the prophet from God that got double the power that Elijah got. And in his, his most impressive resurrection where he, he was able to resurrect somebody, he wasn't even alive. And it gets one verse. And then you get to Jesus' stories about, you know, hey, I'm going to raise this person and this person, this person. And it's like, with all these stories coming out, people might start wondering, where's the evidence? And so wouldn't it be cool if we had a story about another person who wouldn't believe until they could put their fingers in the holes in his hand and, you know, whistle through it or whatever. We had to have that story mm -hmm. so that when, when Paul and I say, why don't we get to put our fingers in the hands of Jesus to confirm the resurrection? They can be like, God already knew you'd say that. That's why. You know, he already proved it to Thomas, and Jesus specifically said, the rest of us are blessed for having not seen. Cool. I got an oil rig I'll sell you, and you'll make twice as much money if you don't ever ask to see it. Bizarre. I'll take the lesser blessing if I get to also put my fingers in there. I'll just take the lesser blessing. I'm cool with that. I I'd finger Jesus. <laughs> uh dave in the uk pronouncer he um wants to talk i guess oh i see the i see the number 100 percent several times here and i yeah i hope this isn't going to be a big sticking point dave because you do realize you're talking to someone at least me paul may be different who says yeah. that you can't be 100 percent certain about anything exactly that's one of the reasons why i wrote what i wrote precisely because we can't be 100 percent certain about anything now, I'm a theist, I'm a Christian, but I don't see any need to evangelize to everyone, or perhaps more importantly, even to evangelize to myself that I am 100% certain that God exists, because we can't be 100% certain that God exists. And one okay, thing I'm, that I'm confused. annoys me. I, I'm confused. Right. Are you saying you don't feel the need to go and evangelize to anyone, or you just don't need to evangelize 100% certainty? I, well, I mean, I, I, I don't evangelize. <laughs> no, personally, I don't. Evangelize. So, so why, um, why, why do you disregard the command in the Bible to evangelize? Well, the first reason is because it was almost certainly added in later by the early church. We know that the Gospel of Mark originally ended abruptly with, and they said nothing. Yeah, but the Great Commission isn't just in Mark, it's also in Matthew. True, true. Um, and, and, and while yeah. Mark 16, 9 through 20 probably aren't, they, they may be later interpretations, or interpolations, Matthew 28, um, I'm not aware of anybody saying that that ending wasn't there. Fair, fair enough. I... I see your point. Um, and it's 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 in red letters, so we know that Jesus said it. Allegedly, right? yes. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on the yeah. allegedly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Continue. Yeah. So the point the point, the point I wanted to get into is precisely because we can't be one hundred percent sure. I don't think it's. Uh, I, I don't think that there, we can award ourselves a warrant to try to force our views on it to everybody else. And one of the things that annoys me about uh, if you spend any long enough time on the theist and atheist debating circuit, 
is when you run into presuppositionalism, where they convince themselves that they can be 100% certain and that their certainty is because we're right because we're right. We can't not be right. And we argue from being right rather than to being right. And it annoys me, and I'm going to be honest, uh, I have more tests of my faith from hearing extremely bad arguments from extremely confident people who are absolutely convinced they're right than I do listening to atheists. I can listen to atheist epistemology for hours and agree with a lot of it. And then you hear extremely bad, aggressive presuppositionalism from people like Saitan Bruggen Kate, and you just think to yourself, what are these people smoking? And it just, I just think that it's almost like sometimes religious people think that they, they forget that it's about faith. They forget that faith is a necessary component of being religious. Why? You, why? 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 How are you we using don't have faith? Evidence. How are you using faith? Are you are you saying faith is belief in the absence of evidence? Well, it is. It is belief okay. in the absence of evidence. Why are you saying that's essential? Well, it's essential to religious belief. It's more or less what makes religious belief religious belief versus something else. Okay, but you're 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 suggesting that it's essential, like. It's a requirement. Why would a God require gullibility? Well, we don't know. And one option could easily be that there isn't a God. And I can accept that that's an option, that there isn't a God. But I personally don't believe that that's, that there is, that, that that's the correct answer. So you believe there is a God Yes. But that there's not a good reason to believe that. Well, I think that we can, almost everybody, well, we, we can have reasons to believe it um, or not want to cross the floor, as it were, that I was raised a Christian. I was born a Christian, I was raised a Christian, and I don't see... And a reason to cross the floor into atheism. I think that there could be a God. I have faith that there is a God. I understand that there isn't direct evidence of a God. This, this is so weird, Dave. Um, yeah. You seem to be suggesting that the burden of proof is on the atheist and not on the theist. Well, not really. It's also, it's like, like, like if I was... Uh, Dave? If I was an Dave, atheist... Did you... Dave, did you not just yep. say that you don't see a reason to cross over into atheism? That sentence yep. suggests that atheism has some burden of proof that it hasn't met, when in fact, atheism is the rejection of the theistic claim, and the, the reason for it is because the theistic claim hasn't met its burden of proof, which you acknowledge it hasn't and may not be able to do. Well, from my point of view, being a Christian or being born a Christian, from my perspective, I would You're want not born a reason a to stop being a Christian. Yeah, you, you weren't born well, a Christian. Raised Nobody's raised born. Raised you Christian. weren't born a Christian. Nobody's born a Christian. But instead, um, you've acknowledged that Christianity may not be true and has not been its burden yeah. of proof. How could you possibly say that? atheism has something to prove then you're basically saying you're going to keep believing something that may not be true and has not met its burden of proof because because nobody's proved that it's not true how many other things do you think have failed to meet their burden of proof and may not be true that you also believe well i I see your point. I don't want you to think that. Do I'm you though? Because, I'm because, I... because is it possible that atheism isn't true and that atheism also hasn't met its burden of proof? In which case you have Christianity 
that hasn't met its burden of proof and may not be true, and a particular yeah. version of atheism that hasn't met its burden of proof and isn't true, and yet you're suggesting that you're justified in picking one over the other? Well, I think that an atheist would be perfectly justified in saying the same thing, but then saying to a theist of any description, well, you haven't given me a reason to stop being an atheist. And I don't think no, that but, would be an No, but that's because position. that's the default position, Dave. The default position is to not be convinced of something until there's sufficient reason to believe it. Well, I, I do. I understand that. And it is something that I, it's something that I think about a lot. Okay. And it's honestly so something that here's I the struggle thing. with. Personally, should I be an atheist? Here's the thing. If somebody says a God exists. Yeah. They've adopted a burden of proof, right? Yep. And until they meet that burden of proof, we should not believe their claim, correct? Uh, yes, I think that's fair. Congratulations, you just justified the atheist position of, I do not believe the claim that God exists because it hasn't met its burden of proof. But you are saying that despite it not being the burden of having met its burden of proof, you're going to keep being a Christian and not change. Well, I personally, I don't see, I mean, m maybe, maybe you're right. Um, but I, so I, I would like to ask if you don't mind, if, if everything we've said is right, and I think we more or less agree on our epistemology here, should I be an atheist? What is the default position on the claim that a God exists? Probably that it doesn't. Probably that we don't have reason to believe that it does. Okay. Until such time as that changes, shouldn't we all be in a position of saying, I don't have reason to believe a God exists? Probably, yes. Okay. And I call that position atheism. I call it weak atheism, yes. soft atheism, as opposed to the assertion yeah. that there is no God. And yeah, so yeah. by your own acknowledgement, yes, you should be an atheist. So what would you say to Christians who, I mean, I, what, what would you say to Christians who are absolutely convinced with 100% certainty, not based on, um, let's say, for the sake of argument, evidentialism, what would you say to people that, believe that that say that oh there has to be a god because he has a book or there has to be a god because logic exists or what i would honestly say are silly arguments like that uh, what would you say to somebody who tries tries to consciously fill this gaping hole in our epistemology with there is a God and there can't not be a God because I want there to be a God. Now, I don't know if you think I'm going off topic or not, but I would like to hear your thoughts on it, if that's okay. I'd like them to prove it. I don't think you get to presuppose a God. Where's the evidence? I agree. I agree. And it's one, it's, it's, it's one thing that does, it does annoy me about now coming from the UK, we, there's a lot of what we might call, I can see in the chat about cultural Christianity, there is a lot more cultural Christianity here in the UK and in parts of Europe than there might be in the US. It's something that I was not really familiar with, um, but it just, it, it made me so almost angry and confused listening me to too the first dawkins time. just irritated yeah. the shit out of me a week or so ago by advocating for cultural christianity right after he lambasted i on her cle for essentially becoming a cultural christian um it's it's bizarre i don't know what the hell they're putting in the water over there in europe but um yeah, yeah. The thing I'd say in a, a, limit, a limited defense of Dawkins over Ayan Hirsi Ali on this is that uh, Dawkins is still an atheist. Dawkins is uh, Dawkins does not believe it's true, and he's not professing to believe it's true. He's neither is Ayan Hirsi Ali. Seeming, neither is Ayan Hirsi Ali. If you read if you read her statement, she 
mm-hmm. advocated for conversion to Christianity as a practical matter to fight Islam. What did Dawkins just yeah. do? Dawkins suggested that mm-hmm. if he were forced to make a choice between Christianity and Islam, he would pick Christianity. By the way, so would I, but I'm not forced to yeah. make that decision and neither is anybody else. And I'm not forced yeah. to exactly. advocate for cultural Christianity. So I fail to see what you don't Dawkins' have to pick position two mafia I, bosses. One of I, yeah, I don't. I fail to see what Daw- how Dawkins' position is in any way superior to Ian Hersey Lee's. I think Daw- I think Dawkins' position is it's almost like an Alex Malpass's discussion on presuppositionalism, the difference between a harder presupposition and a softer presupposition. That if uh, that if society acts as it, I think Dawkins' position is more if society acts as if these values are better or the best it's better whereas i think if i'm not misunderstanding i think that ion here's young lee's position is society should actively believe this because to not actively believe this is to admit is to open the door to bad ideas that's a that's a horrible um, position as well because you Belief yeah. isn't subject yeah. to doxastic volunteerism. You don't just get to decide, I'm going to believe this. You can act as if you believe yeah, it, and you it, can try and spread it, but you, you can't just say, oh, we should it, believe this. No, um, that's not the way so belief should work. Th- that's how I would have differentiated between what Dawkins is saying about purely cultural issues in his mind versus Ian Hirsi Ali's position, who seems to think that the profession of a false belief could be utilitarian, use, useful, distinct from clinging to cultures that came about from a false belief. <laughs> well, they're both, I find them both to be ridiculously wrong on this subject and, and not particularly useful in their thoughts on advocating for Christianity, cultural or otherwise. Um, if, if, if the whole position is, well, atheism's just not gonna win, so we need to pick the least harmful religion, um, yeah, I, I can yeah. certainly see why they do that, but I don't need to. Yeah, yeah. But no, it's like I, I do I think that's where the difference comes between the two positions. And I've, I also heard, if you don't mind me asking about a perhaps related issue, is that um, we also we have uh, not not just presuppositionalism, but particularly people who try to say, oh, but what about morality after their original arguments fail? It almost seems like these extremely aggressive presuppositional certainty positions are essentially advocated for by people who have nothing else left that it's more to convince themselves that they can't be wrong than it is to even convince themselves that they're right or or, or certainly to ever convince anybody else. I'm wondering if you think that's true or useful or completely wrong. I, I try, although I fail, and I've already failed once today, I try not to speculate about what's actually going on in somebody else's mind. On some occasions, I think their actions demonstrate pretty clearly part of what's going on in their mind. You know, I'd rather not, I, I'd rather fake being a mind reader as part of an act than, than try and do it here. And I find the, the speculation, it's like, I, I don't know what use it is. I mean, if I'm going after a caller who's had a particularly difficult time um, engaging in what is a pretty, fairly straightforward, honest conversation about a question, okay, I'll put on my, my asshole hat and, and, yeah, rant about yeah. what's probably in their mind but generally speaking i think it's a mistake for any of us to suggest what somebody's motivations are um or to suggest that we know their motivations in a way that is better and more accurate than they've actually uh, expressed them i'm gonna screw it up but i don't need to do it at the drop of a hat fair yeah. Um, I wonder if, I mean, I mean, we, we, we can't read minds, obviously, um, but I'm wondering if uh, we end up essentially just sitting by ourselves thinking, well, I know <laughs> almost into solipsism or well, a form of it culturally, for want of a better term. Well, I know what I think. I don't really know what anybody else thinks. And I'm just going to sit 
and uh, sit and not know. Um, am, am I straw man in here or? Well, but those aren't the only options, right? Because the people I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, so your Frank Turek's, your Ken Ham's, like all these people. Yeah, yeah. It can be a fun game all day long to guess. Are they grifting? Do they really believe it? Like, the, uh, are they are they just repeating things mindlessly? Like, all that thing doesn't matter because the other option is I'm just going to d pretend I'm a member of the audience, right? And just, like, the audience is taking yeah. it at face value. So what does, and even they would say with someone like Donald Trump they're following, well, it doesn't matter if whether the person delivering the message believes it, God is using that person to get the message out. So uh, the the option isn't just to sit at home and just do, do not, I mean, that's that's a fair option if you want, but that's not the only yeah. option. We, we don't have to imagine that the person were, the ideas, for example, in every call we've had today, the thought has crossed my mind. Are these people being serious or not? Like, are these people really? Yeah, yeah. And so, but it doesn't matter because we have this show. And, and until someone gives us, you know, even when they do reveal sometimes being a bad actor, we take the ideas at face value. That's our interlocutor that, that we're just going to go with. Yeah. And, and the, the whole mind reading, the guessing what their motivations are, it doesn't help the audience. It doesn't help us maybe refine our ideas and show ourselves where we're wrong. A bad actor could give us ideas that show us that we're wrong. So that's just, I yeah. guess, why Matt and I don't spend any of our spare brain cycles uh, just wondering about people's motivations because ultimately it doesn't matter. Except when I do. Oh, okay. Hey, I, I'm, well. in agreement, <laughs> I, I'm in agreement with Paul, except for when I do. And I, I want to kind of explain the how and why behind when I do. So, for example, there are people that think the 2020 election was rigged and stolen. Um, and mm -hmm. so when I see people saying that, one of the questions is, do you really believe that? Or is this just wishful thinking on your part? Is this a narrative you're going to go with? And at the end of the day, it might not make any difference because they're going to vote the way they vote, whether they actually believe the election was stolen or whether they just think that that's a useful thing. In discussions about, well, um, hang on, Sorry. in discussions about yeah, yeah. Um, a um, a pregnant person's right to choose. I've had conversations with my ex-wife and other people who, who would say things like, oh, the religious right, they just want to punish women for having sex. They want to punish women for their biology. They want to, you know, control this. And I've always pointed out, it's a mistake to say what their motivations are because that you, you will almost never be able to prove that. But what you can do is say that no matter what their motivations are, they're advocating policies that have the effect of punishing women for their biology, punishing people for having sex, et cetera. And so the, the, when I make an exception, like I did earlier today, to go off on an individual about what I suspect is in their head, that's not um, me trying to assess the general public to what percentage of them believe um, that the election was stolen or anything else. That's me specifically trying to get in that person's head and make them think about, holy crap, do I actually believe what I said I, I believe? Am I actually being serious here? I am, am I engaged in some dishonesty here? And if they come out the other side confident that they were honest, well, they're probably wrong, but at least they will have thought about it. Yeah, and the only thing I would say on that is uh, to take these two examples, um, the January 6th example and the abortion example, and both my general idea is that in general, you want to believe the, I, because I think most people are mostly good most of the time, I want to believe absent evidence to the contrary, motivations that cast people in the best light that we can afford to give them. And on the abortion question, particularly from a religious perspective, from the abortion question, such an idea is that they genuinely believe that life begins at conception and this is inviolable. And in order to change people's minds on that question, you have to engage with that argument and to say whether that why that might be wrong, how that might not be biblical, how we don't 
particularly particularly when people support the death penalty, how we don't believe life to be inviolable and have conversations that way, as opposed to jumping in saying you just want to control people's bodies. Now, if it turns out they do want to control people's bodies, now we, we'll find a way to uncover that in the debate. But on the January 6th thing, the thing that scares me more about the January 6th thing is that from my perspective, it's actually more charitable to assume that these people are grifters because the alternative that they sincerely believe the election was stolen out with no evidence to, to support that and plenty of evidence to oppose it is to believe that these people are completely and utterly disconnected from reality and living in a completely alternative reality. And how the hell do you deal with that? And more importantly, how the hell would you deal with a situation in which even half of the people who profess that genuinely 100% believe it? It, 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 it? It's a horrifying thought. But that doesn't help. You're, you're, you're again. You, you're, you're choosing a motive that you prefer to believe that. But that actually doesn't help deal with the problem if, in fact, that is a significant portion of the people's motive. So again, you're, you're advocating these weird, utilitarian and good feeling scenarios for yourself that aren't necessarily helpful. Do you see that? Um, I do. I understand your point, and but partic- especially as it relates to the January sixth example, I think particularly politically, whenever people profess, whenever people profess a political or religious belief, I think we should begin our discussion with uh, assuming that what they say is what they mean, and then attacking what they say, and then they either have to climb down, give us a rebuttal, or they have to take the mask off. And it's situations like January 6th that really put that to the test. Because if you ask the January 6th person, why were you there? A lot of them will say that we're there because the election was stolen. And that's something that you just irrationally, perhaps, you don't want to believe that these people genuinely believe it. So you want more evidence to believe that they believe. I mean, I appreciate this is probably extremely irrational, but I think it's how a lot of people would think whenever somebody says something as crazy as that, or if somebody says that they really believe that they also had a virgin birth and they're the next prophet of a god, for instance. It's easier to believe that that person just wants to sell books than it is to believe that that person genuinely believes it. And it, it, it might be too How's that relevant? Standards. It might be completely yeah. irrational. It, it, it's not remotely relevant. You don't have any access to whether they sincerely believe or not. It may or may not make any difference. And I can tell you that we know there are people who sincerely believe things like that. And that we know that there are people who are frauds. Until I have a way of telling the difference, I begin by assuming people mean what they say. And then when I catch them in a conflict, um, which I've gotten pretty good at asking the right questions to to identify some of those conflicts, then I can call that out. But that's only if actual conversations about these things fail. Like if we're just going to keep you know leading in circles. And it's it, it's funny that you watch the people who are like, oh, I'm I'm absolutely confident that Jesus was divine, and then you get them to acknowledge, well, maybe yeah. Jesus wasn't divine. There's a poss- possibility. This, yeah. The street epistemology aspect of this, where you are asking questions to try to reduce somebody's confidence level, is is massively problematic. Don't get me wrong. I I love Magna Bosco, and I love a lot of the other people who engage in street epistemology, and I see that there is some use in it. But here's the thing. Yeah. Street epistemology follows a format. If you begin with how confident are you in this belief? And they say 99% at the beginning. And then you have a 10 minute conversation with them and they say, oh, at the end of it, I'm only 72% confident. Did you in fact lower their confidence from 99 to 72? Or was their confidence 72 the entire time and they were just exaggerating and and, and being a little hyperbolic yeah. and saying it was 99? Yeah. 
And what difference does it make if they're still 72% confident about something? If they're confident enough that you either reduced their confidence to where they're still pretty dang confident, or you reduce their reported confidence to where it should be. And in the end of the, at the end of the day, they still hold the exact same belief that they had before. And the only thing that you've potentially adjusted is what confidence level they're willing to report. But here comes the real sneaky twist. What if they leave mm -hmm. from that encounter and go on yeah. to have another conversation three weeks later with somebody else? What confidence level are they going to report then? 99 or 72 or somewhere in between? There's, there's lots of good stuff to be done and reported and, and, and having conversations yeah. Yeah. with Socratic method and everything else. But maybe, maybe asking people what their confidence level is as silly as asking them why they believe in God, because all you're going to get is a self-reported number that may or may not be accurate. And then instead of having a conversation about whether they should be confident in a God at all, we spend all of our time talking about what confidence level they were, they're willing to report. I, I'm more interested in whether or not they believe it at all, let alone how confident they are. Well, yes, and I do think that if they, that if we want to find out whether they, whether somebody believes it at all, we start our conversation as if the belief is true. We say we perform essentially internal critiques potentially, and then either they have to rebut, they have to maybe qualify a position, or if it was a cover up, well, we'll just go on to the next argument, or somebody will snap and say something that they believe but wanted to not put in the conversation like let's say the anti-abortion politician really did just want to control women well eventually after you break that if you break down the life begins at conception argument enough times he either has to say we're at an impasse he has to qualify his position or he has to go mask up off slip up and say you brought it up again so i just have that. to jump in and say that that is not the best way to argue abortion at all bodily autonomy is the only way to argue abortion i just i live in a household where i'm just obligated mm -hmm. to put that out there i think that what you're proposing is entirely a losing proposition so yeah um if you even if you get the one person to admit that they just want to control people's biology yeah. okay what have you done what have you accomplished you haven't changed uh public policy um you haven't changed their mind and you haven't changed the minds of other people. Sorry? What if that person's a politician who's now on the record saying he just wants to control people? I have that politicians on something. record. I have politicians on record saying they want to be a dictator for a day. You think that makes a fucking bit of difference at all? Not if their name's Donald Trump, I'm sure. Not if their name's anything. The people, the people out there who are going to oppose abortion because they genuinely just look at it as people are killing babies they're not they're still going to vote for that politician who's opposed to abortion even if he's flatly come out and said all i want to do is punish women for having sex with someone that's not me they're still going to vote mm. for that guy that's one of the reasons that paul's saying this strategy that you're talking about it's not a strategy it doesn't get you anywhere mm. okay yeah but i gotta move on because yeah, I mean, we got other callers and we're running out oh, of time yeah, yeah. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was great talking. Nope. For the record, a couple times there, I wondered if Dave was really a theist. So I was questioning his motives. <laughs> there you go. And you go. And and I think Dave may have become an atheist at some point during that conversation, <laughs> and then <laughs> maybe backed out of maybe. it, and then changed it. Who knows? Uh, not the not angels are singing in hell, or wherever, however that happens. We we got uh, one more theist call I want to get to, and then a couple of atheist calls, but. Quick announcements. Uh, first of all, huge thank you to everybody for tuning in and all of the uh, additional information that's out there. This network, The Line, is primarily call-in shows, and we are starting something new as a more regular thing, which is this show is going to end probably in the next 40 minutes or so. My, my, my plan is to make sure that we're done by 5 p.m. Central, and one of the biggest reasons for that is that I want to make sure that I give our producer, Morgan, a break because it's six o'clock. There's a follow-up to the Sunday show, the Sunday show after dark. And that's going to have, I believe, 
Aaron Ra and I think Dr. Aaron Adair. Is that right, Amargan? Uh, no, it's at 7 p.m. Central Time. Uh, and it is, ah. it is Aaron and Aaron. Aaron and Aaron. Because I think that the, the uh, like when I click on the live thing, it shows 6 p.m. Yeah, Aaron had to time. fix it this afternoon. Cool. But YouTube probably hasn't caught up yet. <laughs> YouTube will catch up. So, well, then you'll get more time off. All right, let's let's get these last couple calls in real quick here because we have a theist whose position is that God is the best explanation as to why anything at all exists. So, Amir in the UK, pronouns are he, him. Uh, welcome to the show. What makes you think that God is the best explanation for why anything exists? Yeah, hi, guys. Um, sure. So... I just wanted to make a point that even though I think that God is the best explanation as to why anything at all exists, it doesn't necessarily mean that that explanation is going to be anything, you know, overwhelming, uh, overwhelmingly compelling. I still think that there's a lot of holes in the God hypothesis, so to speak, but out of all of the options that we do have, it does appear to be the most compelling. That it's not compelling is not news to matter, I. Sorry? Matt and I are aware that it's not compelling, so we can continue on. Yeah, and, sure, and but... this, this, this issue uh, about how compelling it is or isn't, um, why on earth do you think, and, and which God is most compelling and why? I'm not advocating for any religious God. The That's God not what I, I asked. The... What did you ask? I asked, which God is most compelling and why? Okay, and I feel like I was addressing that. So the God that I would say is the most compelling is a non-religious God, as in... I don't know I'm what that happy. means. So just consider it to be a more broader kind of... Uh, creator type figure rather than a god that possesses qualities that are synonymous with anything that we find in religious scripture okay so any god that possesses the qualities from religious scripture we throw out so any god that is maximally powerful we just chuck that one out um i, I mean when i when i talk about qualities that are synonymous with religious scripture i'm talking more on a more, uh, on a moral basis so you know a god that is issuing us with 10 commandments to live by etc now i would say to that point that god would be by definition all-powerful and all-knowing okay I, I i'm i'm really like almost beyond bored and irritated i just want to find out what are the properties and qualities of the God that you think exists? So the God would need to, he would be acting with intentionality. That would be one attribute. But the reason why anything at all exists is because he has willed it to exist and thus as intentionality would be unfathomably powerful and intelligent do you know what the word quality means but probably not on the same semantic definition that you have which is going to be sure tell definition. me one tell me one feature of the god that you're advocating for i i, I just have unless that, i need you to start I, I need you to start over and just give me one so that we can address it pick one acts with intentionality okay why is it more probable that the universe is the result of a being that acts with intentionality than not well, how did you determine that probability um so what other options exist to explain that's a fallacy that is a fallacy that is absolutely an argument from ignorance fallacy where you're shifting the burden of proof. I asked what led you to it. You don't then get to say, what else could there be? So 
when I say, why is it more probable than not that a God, a being with intentionality is the explanation for the universe, you don't get to toss that back with a, what other explanation could be? Because I'm not the one proposing an explanation for the origin of the universe. I don't think we have any way to explore the origin of the universe. You're the one who's come up with an answer and a specific list of qualities of what is the most probable explanation. Are you going to defend that or are you going to dodge like everybody else? Incorrect. I'm not saying that God um, is the hypothesis that uh, is, you know, explains why anything could. I'm going to mute you because I don't want to have to call you a liar. What it says here from the call screener, God is the best explanation as to why anything exists at all. When I took the call, I asked you why you believed that God is the best explanation for why there's anything at all you immediately distanced the God that you're advocating for from a religious God and then gave it the same feature as the religious God, which is acting with intentionality. I then asked you why a God asking, acting intentionally is more probable than other explanations, and you have since dodged. So don't tell me that you're not advocating for a God when I'm specifically asking you to defend the fucking God that you just gave me the fucking property for, which is a being that acts with intentionality. Why is that more probable than not? Am I off mute? Yes. Yes. Okay. Just kind of, look, let's just, can we just make a very quick point of clarity here? My call, the purpose of this call was to demonstrate why God is the best explanation as to why and do it exists. and stop oh. fucking do it stop with the other shit and do it if you're saying god is the best explanation for the universe and you're saying that god is an intentional agent then <clears throat> how is it not a perfectly acceptable question for me to ask you why is it more probable than not that the origin of the universe is an intentional agent what's wrong with that question yeah. what's wrong with that question there's nothing wrong with the question. There's everything then why wrong the with fuck did you object to that question? There's everything that, there's everything that's why did you object to that question? Chill. Dude. Chill. Why did you Chill. object to that question? I, I didn't object to the question. I'm just trying You're, to see, understand really. You didn't object to that question. I, I don't know. I'm not going to say what happened. Everybody can rewind and find out if Amir did in fact object to that question. But because I'm pretty sure I didn't just fucking waste all this time trying to get you to answer the question that you didn't object to. So see, why is it more probable? Why is it more probable than not that the cause of the universe is an intentional agent? Yeah, I mean, look, so I would say that the origins of space, time, matter, and energy cannot be contained by itself. Space, time, matter, and energy is not responsible for the origins of space, time, matter, and energy. It would what, what, seem to what, make, be, what makes you think that matter and energy have an origin? Um, well, from everything that I understand, when it comes to mathematics, we can't have an infinite chain of course. No, no, we can't have, no, that's correct. That's correct. And but it, I've it, never it, met a cosmologist who suggested that matter and energy had an origin. So I'm wondering what makes you think matter and energy had an origin well the standard my, my understanding is that the standard view in cosmology is that there was a starting point no no what do you think the singularity was <laughs> my understanding again is that the singularity is something that cannot exist in the real world and this is why scientists are looking for a theory of everything okay. we understand so that i'm going to let you continue with your explanation but understand you guys continuously make a point when you guys are being interrupted, but when I'm trying to actually here, you're going to really love this because I was going to let you return. You. Yeah, uh, literally, Paul was just telling you that he's going to let you continue, despite the fact that you have demonstrated you don't have a good understanding of this. Um, but in none of this has anything to do, even if your supposition that matter and energy had an origin, which is not consistent with the best findings of science, isn't something that we could explore. But even if you were correct that it had an origin, you have yet to explain why an intentional agent is the best explanation of that origin. So are you going to keep dancing around? Or are you going to answer the question that I asked you five minutes ago that you fucking objected to? 
in order for something to be the best explanation, it needs to have more explanatory power than the other options that exist. Do we agree on that? I, I agree. God has no explanatory power because we explain things in terms of other things we understand. You can't solve a mystery by appealing to a bigger mystery. Okay, so we do agree that for in order for something to be the best explanation, it needs to have more explanatory power than the other options. So the question that I'm going to first ask you guys is, what other options are there besides God? No, that sir, that's not the way this is? works. I just, I just got done explaining to you that this isn't the way it works. I'm not in, in any way, I will, I, let me try and explain this using the tiniest words possible. I am not claiming that I know what the best explanation for the universe is. My position is that I don't know, and I'm unaware whether anybody else knows either. You are calling in to say that you do know what the best explanation is, and I've asked how you know this, and you have repeatedly avoided it, and then tried to say that the best explanation is the one with the most explanatory power, which I pointed out cannot be true for God because we don't understand God and we explain things in terms of other things that are understood. God has zero explanatory power now and you don't get to avoid that response by asking us to present other potential hypotheses. You need to learn how the burden of proof works and fucking meet it, so put up or shut up. Am I on mute? You were never on mute, you whiny little bitch. Jesus Christ, Matt. You need to really take a lesson on etiquette. Okay, let me mute you again. I don't need lessons on etiquette. I've been doing this for a long time. You called in to defend a proposition. I've asked you questions about that proposition. You have whined like a little bitch and avoided it like a little coward. Now, I'm gonna try this one more time. Are you going to present a defense for why you are convinced that the best explanation for the universe, for anything existing at all, is an, is an agent acting with intent? Yes or no? Yes, and I already have given cool. an explanation, and before it's no, you haven't. It out of control. No, you haven't. Yes, no, you I haven't. Have, have no, okay, I'm going to mute you again. If you've given an explanation for why you think that an intelligent agent is the best explanation, somehow all the rest of us missed it. So give it again and let's confirm that this is actually what you said. What is the explanation for why you are convinced? The explanation that I have given was that the origins of space matter and time have to best be explained by appealing to something that okay i'm going to mute you again because that's not an explanation for why it needs to be an intelligent agent with a purpose i acknowledged that even if your boneheadedly stupid claim that space and time and matter had to have an origin that asserting it has an origin does not in any way affirm that that origin needed to be intelligent. I'm sorry that you can't keep up with these questions, but you have not given an explanation for why an intelligence is required. So now I'm going to unmute you again, and you can say that even if matter and space and time had an origin, why does that require an intelligent agent with purpose, which you have not yet done? So you don't need to repeat yourself. You need to say the best explanation for space and time is an intelligent agent because, and then give the fucking reason. Well, okay, right. Let's start again. So if we grant that the origins of space, matter, and time have a origin that ex, uh, that exists outside of space, matter, and time. Then the Which only thing that can fit. What, dude? What? Why are you interrupting? Jesus okay, Christ, here I'm going to I'm going to mute you again because this is just too difficult for you. Um, 
if we, you said, if we grant, and all I said was, we don't grant that, but for the sake of argument, I will in fact grant this so that you can make some progress. For the sake of argument, the origin, what is the reason for the final time I'm going to ask you, what is the reason that the origin is probably, most probably, an intelligent agent with purpose? Last time. Hello. What did I just ask we... you? What did I just ask okay, you? Okay, well, I'm, I'm not on mute. Then. What okay, did I cool. just ask you? What did I just ask you? Asked, you have asked me to demonstrate if we grant that you can help me make progress in my argument that the origins of space, matter, and time, you know, if we're appealing to something that exists outside of space, matter, and time, why is that demonstrating that it is a God that acts with intention, uh, intentionality? No. Nope. You know, okay. With intelligence. I didn't say God. I didn't say God. I said, why is that an agent with intentionality? Go. An agent of God, tomato, tomato. Um, okay. No, 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 you smug little. Uh, an agent and a God are not synonymous. You might be able to prove an intelligent agent, but that doesn't necessarily prove it's a God. I'm sorry that you're a sloppy thinker who can't get through this without fucking up every 10 seconds, but I'm gonna ask you again. If we grant that space, matter, and time had an origin, why is it that you assert that an agent with intentionality is the most probable explanation for that origin? Try again. Because there is nothing else that we can possibly fathom that best fits that description. Is there anything? Congratulations. You, you are an absolute cartoon. You literally just went straight to the fallacy. There's nothing else we can imagine. Your appeal to personal incredulity. Your argument is it must be an intelligent agent because I can't think of anything else. Thank you for wasting our time. Um, but I don't need to waste time on logical fallacies. There is no Do you have a non fallacious? Yet. Do you have a non fallacious argument? for why that needs to be an intelligent agent, because your argument was just, we can't imagine anything else, and that's a fucking fallacy. Wrong, it is not a fallacy, and if I- It absolutely I is, I've already explained it, and I'm done with you now. The very notion that it must be an intelligent agent because you can't think of anything else is the argument from personal incredulity. Go look it up. I'm not wasting any more of my audience's time on you trying to, I'm happy to teach you, but I'm not happy to waste everybody's time to do it. Sign up for a course. I don't even have courses to sell yet, but. I was gonna say, do we, is, is this a new announcement? Well, you can actually, uh, you can pay me and I will tutor mm. you on logical fallacies, but you know, Virgil in Texas, here. Thank you for waiting for, I don't know, two hours and 44 minutes to ask a question that I probably am not going to have an answer to. I hope Paul does. Uh, thank you, Captain Inboss, and the second best Paul related to religion. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, um, I'll take it. I am, I'm having an issue um, when it comes to, because I've started encountering a lot of people who are Orthodox Christians um, who want to debate morality more often than not, and they always try to apply to this um, uh, this thing that's tangential to metaphysics and is the same thing, which is like, from my understanding, metaphysical things are like abstracts that exist purely in our brain and that we express them. And we have labeled them metaphysics because it is just a, a subset of mental tools that we have and uh, functions that we've identified. Um, but the people I'm talking to seem to think that uh, that there is this like magical reality that is above our minds, and that our brains somehow interact with this transcendent reality to grab metaphysics and like put them into our brain. 
I, I'm really confused by this, and I'm just hoping somebody can help me figure this out because if I'm the asshole, I want to know. Do you possibly mean metaethics instead of metaphysics? They keep claiming metaphysics, but that could be just a mistake on them because, like, they're like pretending there's a transcendent reality they get, like, metaphysical concepts from. That because you can't physically measure metaphysics, that it must be in some transcendent realm. Okay. Um, do. Do your it's it's tough because your friends aren't here, right? So we're 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 guessing at this point as to what they may mean in these things. That I agree, if if you've described it correctly, uh, sounds rather tenuous. Obviously, um, I mean, things you can ask your friends are: do do you think that morality? Like, you need to get on the same page about what morality is. If morality is how humans behave towards other humans if that's what morality is then how does that how can that even be a thing on a realm where there are no humans right like if if before the first human before the first life on earth was there morality if you define it as how humans treat other humans that seems ridiculous to me uh, after the heat death of the universe is there morality also seems ridiculous to me. So I don't understand if if that's how we're talking about morality, um, that that is a thing that can possibly be on some plane where we are not. So that's a question you can ask them. If they are defining morality in some other way, then it's possible you're just talking past each other, in which case you're not having a productive conversation anymore. So did they give you some kind of definition of morality that you can anchor any of this to? Or are they going purely yeah, so they, on intuition? Uh, it seems to be uh, like they are like making metaphysics like synonymous with morality. And so when they talk about morality, they're like that in that same realm, that's where metaphysics are. And it, it's uh, specifically, this is a, a debate forum to where I am speaking to people because I'm trying to figure out things myself and exposing myself to other ideas. And it, it seems to be that like to them, that their morality, it's that presuppositionalist thing of where like there is this transcendent objective morality and that's where we're getting it from. Uh, so this transcendent being, wherever that transcendent being is, that's where that transcendent realm is, which is where it's all beamed into us. And that's where they grab these things from. And when I ask them, like, why is it that with absence a brain that there is no mind, like, readily available in the world, like, we have no evidence of this being a thing, that all our logical processes would naturally follow inside the brain. And we, since we can't demonstrate anything beyond that, it would be foolhardy to assert that there is a some sort of divine realm where we get morality and abstract ideas from it, it almost strikes me like uh, Platonism a little bit, or like the, um, whatever you call it, where like you're, you're discovering forms or you're just like, is the statue inside the marble, that sort of shit. And I've been, I can't pretend, beating my head yeah, I can't pretend to be very, like, I can't pretend to be super well versed on philosophy stuff on, on on a lot of these things but for me morality is just so simple i don't understand all these complications of it if morality is how humans behave toward if it if it speaks to how humans treat other humans then other planes can't possibly come into it right then if he, right. if it's if it's if it's if if one agrees that morality is about reducing harm and increasing flourishing, and you don't even need that second part, even maybe just decreasing harm. Uh, no other plane need be applied to evaluate whether one set of actions causes more harm than another set of actions, right? You can, you can argue that entirely on our plane. So if it was me, I would keep nailing them to what their definition of morality is. And, and if, if they at all agree with this grounded version of morality, which is the only version I care about, I don't care about other weird versions. Um, 
that may exist on other planes where humans don't exist, then you know, then then you're just not then you're just gonna be talking past each other and it's going to be frustrating. So I don't yes. I don't know. Does that make sense? It, it absolutely does. I'm just it, I was just so flabbergasted by it because this is the like seventh person that is I have reached this like impasse of okay so where do how do you measure emotions like where are emotions are they in the brain or are they in the soul and is it like abstracted from a transcendent reality and like i'm starting to wonder if this is like a new presupp uh, presuppositionalist like um argumentation method or like uh something new they're trying to take a stance on because i keep having it reappear and i'm just confused that i was wondering if there's something i'm missing Personally, when it comes to metaphysics, that like when you talk about metaphysics, is it necessarily like in a religious context? Because I don't, I've never got that impression. And so, like when we're talking about metaphysics, is that like a supernatural concept that they're putting on, um, like actual um, processes that we experience in our brain, or is metaphysics like I thought it was, which was just a categorization of all of these? Um, uh, abstract concept. And so you'd I, have I to ask them. Maybe some you'd have to ask them because it can be applied. What difference does it make? <laughs> and none, effectively. I'm just, I'm just, was just clarifying if I made some so sort of error. If we're gonna, if we're gonna say, if we're gonna have any kind of conversation about morality, let's go with something simple. I would say it is immoral to sexually assault another person why do i say that if somebody wants to think that i say that because in some other being in some other meta dimension has some sort of ontology that makes it thus and so and i'm just borrowing from that okay i don't know how you're going to prove that but at the end of the day if you and i agree that it is immoral to sexually assault someone, we add in whatever other circumstances you, you want, then the question then becomes not what is the source of morality, but can you and I correctly discern morality? Doesn't matter if it comes from a God, doesn't matter if it comes from a dimension, doesn't matter if it comes from some arbitrary foundation it doesn't matter if it comes from assuming that life is generally preferable to death and that you know health is generally preferable to sickness it doesn't matter any of that the first question is is it possible for you and i to come to a correct moral understanding and if the answer is yes then it doesn't matter if the ultimate foundation of morality is your god or not and no argument for God, based on morality, can ever work because we've already demonstrated God is unnecessary for morality. If you and I can reach correct conclusions, this gets back to a version of the Euthyphro Dilemma, which, yes, the Euthyphro Dilemma was originally about piety, but the, the moral version of it is, does God say something because it's moral, or is something moral because God says so? If God says so because it's already moral, then God is irrelevant to morality. And another way to look at that is, if we can discern this without relying on God, then God is irrelevant to morality. But if morality is merely what God says, then you have divine command theory, which means God's going to be right no matter what we think. And there is no foundation to make an, a moral argument that a being that you have no interaction with is always right about morality because you don't have access to that being's mind or thoughts on morality at all. All you have access to are what some people are saying about that God. So God is irrelevant to morality. Hundred percent. I think I got the answer I was looking for. Okay, ninety-nine percent. I am super confident. Um, <laughs> but I'm pretty, pretty uh, damn. Thank you both for your time. Thanks, Virgil. Thank you, Virgil. I'm sorry. I don't man, think you're missing anything. Interrupt. No, 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 you're fine. I, I, I was sitting there with my, my hand, and I noticed that uh, <laughs> Stephanie, I was looked like I had an ice cream headache. Not yet, but I will later, because I'm definitely going to have some <laughs> ice cream. Um, yeah, it's, if I, I'm desperate, I was desperately trying to figure out 
the, the nuts and bolts behind that. And you guys were both talking and hitting it. And I'm like, I'm just going to stay out of it until some sort of clarity <laughs> materializes in my head. We have the final call for today's episode of the Sunday show. It is, I believe it's Ivan from Germany. Is that correct? It's correct. Thank you. All right. Welcome. Hi. So, uh, the thing that I have in my family and also I encounter, encounter with other people, uh, some people will say, when you talk about different religions, Islam, Christianity, both Abrahamic religions, of course, it's very, very easy to find things that are mutually exclusive, but they will say, yeah, those things are just cultural stuff or, you know, things added up by people or churches at some point later. Uh, the God is one God, Yahweh, Allah, that's one God, all, all of the things that divide them, that's just bullshit made up of people, by people. What do you say to that? So, First, I wonder why you left, uh, you know, Jewish people out of it. But that's I'll I'll leave that for now. It's just, Go ahead. It's just because, because that's what I encountered. Yeah, but yes, yeah, sure, of course, why not? So, he, until somebody demonstrates that any of these beings exist, there's not going to be a conclusion reached. But what we can say is that Yahweh, Allah, Elohim, Adonai, um, and, and several others are word slash names used to point to the same being in some people's view and different beings in other people's view. When Islam borrows from Judaism, to build its religion in the same way that Christianity borrows from Judaism to build its religion. It's silly for them to pretend that they're not talking about the same God, in my opinion. But if they want to say, no, 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 Allah is different from Elohim or Allah is different from Yahweh, um, I don't care. I don't believe any of them are real. And I don't care what you call them. I will call them Yahweh, if you want, Allah, if you want, motherfucker, if you want. I mean, you can call them whatever. I just need to know, are they real? And so if my if my Muslim friends, uh, which there's not very many of them, um, are, are trying to say that it's, it's a different, that Allah is different, because that's the Arabic word um, from Yahweh, which is Hebrew, and there's other words in Aramaic, and it, it's, I don't care. And so I'm not going to sit here and go, oh, no, 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 you guys believe in the same God, because I don't think they do. I don't think they believe in the same God character. There's distinctions between the characters, uh, which is why we can draw distinctions between what those characters want in the different religions. So if somebody wants to say, well, according to my religion, they're all the same, cool. Now prove that they're true, or the prove that they're real. And if somebody else wants to say, according to my religion, they're not the same, cool. Prove yours is true, because that's all I care about. And until then, we're, we're basically arguing about whether or not um, uh, how Bigfoot has sex and trims his toenails and whether he prefers to be called uh, Sasquatch or Yeti. Or is the Mario that features in Mario Kart the same Mario that was in Donkey Kong? Are they the same Mario? I don't know. It's me. Um. The other thing, Ivan, I've been doing a lot of research of late in the Old Testament, and you'd be hard-pressed to find a serious Old Testament scholar who would say that um, the religion began monotheistically. That, you know, it, 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 it's very little evidence of the... Monotheism seems like a very late development in Judaism, so it's weird to even say necessarily that the Yahweh at the end of the Old Testament is like the same being that was pitched in the Pentateuch to to that created the world, right? So these are just some very fluid, weird lines that one would have to draw. Uh, if, yeah. I mean, the best you can say is literary dependence. Like I would agree that Islam is literarily dependent on those things, but as Matt said, until you can demonstrate that these are real beings, literary dependence is the best we can study. 
the other thing is like uh is cordelia chase in angel the same as cordelia chase in buffy i mean literally it's supposed to be the same character same universe but there are differences about the thing there mm. and for the people who are like really watching angel it's like angel changed spike changed you know oh my gosh um it's a little more clear there but at the end of the day arguing over whether or not allah and yahweh are uh the same it's closer to like is superman and black adam really the same and it was just a copyright fight Is okay. any of that helpful, that, Ivan? That does give some clarity. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Okay. Cool. Well, thank you so much for calling. I appreciate the well, the kind of fun side question there to end off the show today. But we got to wrap it up. So. <laughs> thank you, guys. Have Whoop. Appreciate it. On that note, first of all, hi. Uh, Lord of Morgan, hi, producer of the show. Have I missed an announcement or is there anything else I should announce other than if you want to support the channel, not only can you go to patreon.com slash call the line, but you can also go to linemerch.com and there are other links down below uh, in the description to the show. And in addition to how you can go and apply to be on shows like Inboss, um, upcoming this week, we have... Uh, the Sunday show after dark in like two hours. And I'll, I'll just make them announce all the other stuff after that. Did I miss anything? All good. All good. I got, I got two whole words out of the producer right there. All good. <laughs> which, which is Those awesome. are the best two. Yeah. It, it's nice because we have to wrap this up. So first of all, huge thank you to everybody for tuning in and sitting through a, uh, a nice little three hour Sunday show in anticipation of the eclipse. I'm going to go out on a limb here and make some predictions. The world is not going to end tomorrow. Jesus is not going to come back tomorrow. Um, a lot of people are going to complain that they didn't have a very good view of the eclipse because of the weather tomorrow. And we will be back after the eclipse is over with an episode of Skep Talk, uh, assuming no catastrophic events. Paul, do you, do you care to make any predictions? Uh, well, the one prediction that really struck me was that one caller opened his call by saying that he was going to be unconvincing. That was his very first thing that he said. And I was impressed that he was so astute in, uh, in predicting things. 10 out of 10. Yep. Couldn't have done it better myself. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. As a reminder, there's a bunch of other shows. They, they're going to announce all of them. Just, just click like and subscribe. Ring the bell. You'll get the notifications about the stuff because all we're doing is constantly adding... Uh, more and more shows and more and more opportunities. Don't miss Tuesday's Chewed Gum. It's my favorite new show on the Line Network. Um, and keep an eye out for me and Paul elsewhere outside of the line in our own personal efforts because there might be some cool and interesting things coming out in the near future that I'm not going to tell you about today. On that note... <laughs> Caesar. Please, please, please exercise some humanism, exercise some skepticism, and a little bit of kindness. But if you get if you get kind of irritated, um, it's okay. Just kind of back off eventually. And remember that line, which I posted in a meme the other day is, yes, I, I was rude, but I was rude to an idiot. I don't hear any music. <laughs> It's just quiet. We, we like don't have music no anymore. But no, uh, what we're supposed to do is just talk until someone randomly hits the stop button and we will be cut off mid sentence, so. is my understanding think, of how the show goes. Normally there's like music. Yeah. If I can see, oh, there's Sparky and Jeff and Paul. I can see all those people. Oh, now I hear music now. Go to patreon.com slash call the line. And we're getting demonetized a lot. That's the best way to support us. Patreon.com, call the line.